The third consecutive appearance of the partisans caused the fascist administration even greater alarm. In impotent anger, it took brutal measures against our families, arrested them and expelled them to the remotest parts of the country. When the fascists became convinced that even this did not force us to lay down our arms, they began to form so-called contractors. Such a counterchet of 60 people was formed in Sofia. Its leader was our fellow countryman Boris from the village of Nasalepsi, who had committed dozens of inhuman murders of women and children in Greece. The whole contrachita consisted of the same types. These scoundrels and sadists were specially selected. In addition to the salaries paid to them, they were given the right to rob the population, to take from them everything they liked. It was a new, legalized robbery. At night, they knocked on the gates and windows of peasants, posed as partisans, provoked honest people, and then subjected them to brutal torture. The contratets did not buy food. They stole sheep, piglets, chickens from peasants and lived as Turkish bays once did. During the day, they molested girls and young women, and in the evenings, they went to the fields and shot, forcing the people working there to go home before nightfall. It was forbidden to light lamps. Shots were fired at lighted windows without warning. Women and men who did not manage to return from the mountains or the fields before dark were shot at without warning. It was brutal. To this day, the body of Raina Pavlova from the village of Bokhovi bears traces of terrible beatings. She was beaten for returning from the forest with an empty bag. In the school building in the village of Stresimiropsi, bandits from the Contrachata dishonored five women arrested on suspicion of aiding the partisans. In the village of Kravina Jabuka, they killed Stancho's grandfather for no reason, stole the dowries of several girls and dishonored one. When they got drunk in Slansoxi, they beat an elderly peasant to death, killed a calf and ate it, explaining that it had run into their ambush. The Contrachets committed many such outrages, and therefore the whole population became indignant against them. Dozens of peasants, at the behest of the party, sent letters full of indignation to the government and demanded the immediate removal of the contrachets from the Okolia and an end to their bullying of innocent people. However, to all these letters and petitions, the fascist rulers remained deaf and dumb. When the protests became so numerous that it became impossible not to publicize them, the fascists were forced to fulfill the will of the people and disband the contrachets. But in their place, a little later, a much more frightening gendarmerie was created. Let's go to Bokova. Delcho suggested shortly after the Stresimirov operation. Let's hear what they say about our affairs there, introduce Dencho to our men and find out the details of the expulsion of your kin. I did not object, and after several hours of tedious travelling Delcho, Denko, Velko and I met the dawn in Grandma Tonka's Koshara. The first to discover us was her granddaughter Senka. She immediately ran to tell her grandmother and immediately returned with her. They brought us breakfast, and we gave them half a circle of cheese. We had made a good supply this time. Although the cheese was made from milk that was taken from the trinkans, many of them didn't even know the taste of it. Jokers in the village claimed that cheese had such a pungent odor because it was kneaded with their feet when it was made. Perhaps for this reason, Grandma Tonka and Senka looked at our gift with distrust and curiosity. Following Grandma Tonka came her sisters-in-law, Donka, Senka's mother, and Singilia, Raiko Nikolov's mother. Donka was small in stature and a little younger than her sister-in-law. She was known in the village as a meek woman. All the more, there was no reason for Singilia to quarrel with her. It was not in vain that people said of Singilia that she was as thin as a stick when she was angry. Before, the sisters-in-law were always looking for something to quarrel about, and there was always a noise of bickering in their house. But now the struggle, in which the whole family took part, made both women more restrained and compliant towards each other. As soon as they entered the Koshara, they began to thank us for destroying the cheese factory, called us liberators, and declared that they were ready to undertake the most risky undertaking for our sake. As the hour of dinner approached, an automobile arrived in the village. We heard joyful exclamations and laughter, after which there was great excitement in Grandma Tonka's house. Her sons Nicola and Boris, both working in Sofia, had arrived. Even from the gate they smelled the odour of boiled chicken and pie, and wondered how and how the wives knew of their arrival. But as no one had ever been angry for a good meal, they expressed their gratitude to their kind spouses. We didn't cook for you, said Donka. We have other guests. Her husband, Boris, immediately puffed up. His eyes glistened like a fox, watching for prey. He blinked and jealously asked, 
Tutmu. Who are these guests? Hmm, partisans, said Donka. The brothers looked at each other as if to say that it was better to return to Sophia than to put themselves at risk. The Sheens listened to more than one scolding of their own. When Grandma Tonka saw that her son's fear was out of line, she angrily reprimanded them. Shame on you. How can you scold them for preparing dinner for our saviors? You don't know how we suffered here. Why don't you ask us how we live? These people helped us to get rid of the requisitions. Now we don't give away milk, butter or wool. Go into the storeroom and see how much butter and cheese we've got. It's no shame to slaughter a heifer for them, let alone a chicken. And if you're afraid, go on good riddance. And Grandma Tonka pointed to the door. The brave and truthful words of the old woman tamed the furious men. The brothers calmed down, softened. Where are they? Boris asked his mother. In the barn. How many are there? Go and see. Is ours among them? Yes, he's in charge. You'll get to the point where they'll burn the house down, Nicola said. If only our eyes hadn't seen how you'd dance then. It was time for dinner, and we began to look through the window of the barn. Each of us was anticipating the pleasure of our favourite meal. One of us was waiting for pie, another for mamaliga, and the third for a rich chicken soup. I, for example, was in favour of chicken soup. Our appetite increased even more when the tempting smells of spices reached our sense of smell. But then all of Grandma Tonka's children and family showed up at the door. Nicola and Boris hesitated again before entering the barn, but when they met our reproachful gaze, they hesitantly crossed the threshold and took turns greeting us by the hand. They immediately went on the offensive. Well, until when do you intend to hide in corners and put us at risk? Boris asked. Yes, until we defeat the enemy. You're crazy. How can you cope with a hundred thousand police and an army? We can. Don't think that there are as many of us as you see. There's an army of us too. I say, it's better to surrender in time. They'll kill you all anyway, Boris said suddenly. How can you fight against the whole state? What have you achieved so far? Nothing, except expelling your relatives. My house will burn down one day because of you. You don't have a home here, Grandma Tonka cut him off. It's mine. Don't you have the shame to say such nonsense? I'm ashamed that I gave birth and raised such cowardly sons. Hmm, Papa, said Little Sanka suddenly. I used to be afraid of the partisans too. But when I realized what good people they were, I called them to our house. Her father shook all over, his lips curved with anger. He could not even allow that his little daughter was connected with the partisans and that this chick was teaching him a grown man. Shut up, little girl, or I'll hit you and you'll be out of here. Now I couldn't help myself and went on the offensive. Why are you threatening the child? What a father. Instead of picking up a gun and going to fight, you're intimidating us with the authorities. If you're afraid for your own skin, say so and we'll go away. And if you're sorry for lunch, say so too, we'll do without lunch. We're used to hunger and cold. But remember, the time will come when you dare not look us in the eye. Boris, shouted Grandma Tonka. Shut up, shut up. I'll be damned for giving birth to you, such a talker. If you're against these people, get out of my house. I won't grieve for you. Nicola was silent the whole time. He must have sympathized with us and therefore looked at things differently. Singelia and Donka were also silent, but their silence was accompanied by expressive facial expressions, which meant that it was time for us to start a brutal war against their husbands to overcome their fear. Nicola, sensing that the argument was getting out of line, got up from the rock on which he was sitting and said to his bra, Boris, there is no need to make a fuss. These are our people. It's true it's a bit scary, both for them and for ourselves, but there is no fight without risk. Finally, if one of us has to suffer, we'll suffer. You are right, Baikolo Densho said. It is impossible to achieve communism without struggle, and so... So it is, Nicola continued. We are afraid and we admit it, but... Don't you know how much grief I suffered and how much money I spent when Raiko was arrested? All summer I worked for Dragulov and Baikushev. After this confession, he turned to the women. Mom, Singilia, Donka, help them. They are our people. Help them and take care of yourselves. Well, what do you say? Grandma Tonka turned to her youngest son. We'll help, murmured Boris, and taking my hand, said, 
Slavo, nephew, goodbye, and when there is a need, come back. What goodbye is there? Sit down here near me, and we'll have lunch. Doris sat down, calmed down, and called Senka. The girl wrapped her thin arms around his neck, stroked his face, kissed him. She was the most pleased with the change in her father. When all sat down and prepared to eat, Grandpa Tonka crossed herself and said, No, children, eat to your heart's content. May the Lord protect us from all harm. On June 10, several policemen came to Behova. They summoned my father to the tavern and made him sign the following document queue. I, the undersigned Stam and Savov Zaitanov, from the village of Bahavi in Tryan Okoya, certify that I have received through Mr. Triano Korya chief a letter from the head of the regional police department in Sofia, which invites my son Slapcho Stamanov Savov to return home to his parents within five days, counting from June 10 of this year. D. To return home to his parents and live under legal conditions, since it is declared to him that he will not be prosecuted in spite of all the crimes he has committed against the law on the protection of the state. Otherwise, he will be considered a brigand. The village of Bohova. June 10, 1943. Recipients and Savov. I don't know whether the Okolian chief really counted on my return and legalization, but he was furious to the extreme when, quite unexpectedly for his police, we made an attack in Glavanovsi. Then Dragilov summoned my father to try and handed him an extraordinary notice. It stated that our entire family was to be expelled immediately. Shocked by the terrible news, my father returned home the same day. As soon as he crossed the threshold, he shouted to his mother, Majidu, pack your belongings. What for? Mother was frightened. We're being deported. Somebody has to pay for all these destroyed cheese factories and burned down offices. Hey, as long as Slavcho is alive and they can send us wherever they want. If that's the case, let's pack your things and I won't touch anything until I see him. Maybe he'll tell me to go into the woods. You're the only thing missing there, Mother said ironically. That's just the sort of people they gather to stink of cigarettes. They got Rangel, didn't they? And he smokes too? Rangel is one thing, but you are another. Why am I different? Oh, look, we'll quarrel, threatened my father. Tom was silent. It was pointless to argue with him. Besides, she was sure that all this talk about going to the forest was nothing. The next day the yard was blue with police uniforms. They poured into the house and started making orders. Get your things together quickly and come out. You have one hour at your disposal. Mother and grandmother fussed, and the children stood bewildered under the gaze of the policemen. What are you gaping at? Get out of here. One of the policemen shouted at them. Have you never seen the police before? Why, yes, we have. You came in the spring, said Pichot, my brother. If you've seen them, get out of here. Ordered the policeman and waved his hand at them. The children ducked through the door and ran out into the courtyard. The shouting of the policemen, their baleful glances that followed our every move, made their grandmother and mother even more confused. They were rushing from room to room, stopping to gather their thoughts, but from excitement only move things from place to place. This infuriated one of the policemen. He went up to the mum and yelled, What are you doing walking back and forth like you're on a walk and not packing? Don't you think it's going to be all right? Mom clutched herself so he wouldn't hit her, and trembled, but not from fear, but from grief. Oh God, what have we come to, being thrown out of our own house? She said almost to herself, but the policeman heard her words and shouted even higher. Don't pray to God, but hurry up and move. You yourself believe in God and your son is a rub- He is not a brigand. You call him that. You'll grumble to me some more, and you'll try the whip threatened the policeman. Muss us up, will you? said the grandmother, snapping at her. They have nothing to do with it. They received an order and they are doing it. Mom was silent, but she couldn't calm down. She couldn't remember what she had taken and what she had left. It was good that father kept calm and locked the chests. Why do you leave so much stuff behind? Ironically, with a challenge, asked the same policeman, who was simply angry. You won't find what you leave anyway and he laughed cynically. Maybe the day will come, and we'll laugh, my father said angrily. So you threaten. Look, it's not the last time we'll see each other. If we meet in the basement of the Oakley police station, we'll have no bones to pick. My father jumped with anger. He couldn't find the words to answer him, but at that moment his mother passed by him. She pushed him in the side and whisper, 
I stop it, swallow it. Muttering something, he put his hands in his pockets and went out. The policeman followed him out. As they left the yard, my mother and grandmother crossed themselves. But then curses burst from their chests. A thousand times be damned the one who threw us out of the house. Then they bade farewell to the few neighbours who ventured near their house and walked ahead of the police escort. In the city they were held without food for three days. Dencho and Stefan's relatives were also driven here, and the unknown fate of the exiles awaited them as well. 182. As they passed through the square, a large crowd gathered to see them off. The police regarded this as a demonstration and took immediate action to disperse the people. My father was sitting in the truck on which all three families were loaded. He could not stand it, stood on the side of the truck and shouted, Citizens, do you see what they're doing to innocent people? This never happened even under the Turks. He didn't have time to say the rest. One of the policemen pulled him down and kicked him. The behaviour of the representatives and guardians of the authorities contributed to the fact that even people like my father, who had previously been ready to serve the fascist regime faithfully, became rioters. Although after we destroyed the two cheese factories and the Strezimirovka communal administration, there were still three communal administrations and one cheese factory in Trina Okula. The communities in the villages of Vukan, Liwareka, Filipochi and the cheese factory in Lyalinsi, we believed that it was time to move to Bresnik district. Here we planned to destroy the cheese factory in the village of Yaroslavsi and to set fire to the communal administration in the village of Krasava near Bresnik. All this we planned to do in August. These were serious operations, which we could not accomplish with our own forces alone. We had to bring reinforcements from Sofia. At the beginning of July, Delcho and I went to the capital. At the same time, we found out about Mordecai's behaviour in the police and did our best to warn the secretaries of the party organisations and other responsible comrades about the need to take all precautions. With the detachment in place and other favourable conditions, it would be a crime if any of us were unable or unwilling to take advantage of these circumstances and allow ourselves to be arrested. The Lyalichis factory lay just on our way to Sofia. It required no more than three or four men to destroy it. That's why Densho went with us just in case we had a chance. At the same time, we wanted to acquaint him with our trusted people throughout the Sofia Canal, whom he did not know yet, because he might need them too. In Zabel, we went to the Miller Bay Tusho. He, too, was afraid of Mordecai's treachery. In order to mislead the police, we produced a letter the same evening which we mailed. By Tosho, having received it, was supposedly to notify Bakushev and Dragulov of it secretly from us. The letter was of the following content. We know from many sources that you sell flour on the black market. For the sake of personal enrichment, you are shamelessly slaughtering poor peasants and supplying free of charge the best flour to those who are close to power and share your fascist views. We would do not stop these outrages as soon as possible. We will be forced to punish you severely. You know what we did to Tritko Tritkov and you can understand how serious our warning is. We put three signatures under the letter. Delcho's, Dencho's and mine. At that time in the community of Glavnovo, they were looking for a person to be the headman. But no one wanted to take on the job without our consent. The only candidate suitable for us was a Sengruve, brother-in-law of Baitosho, but even he did not dare to submit an application to the Okolian chief before receiving our consent. When we met Groove at Baitosho's house, we offered him the following condition. Not to give any information to the police about our whereabouts and movements. To give us immediately the names of peasants who inform him about the partisans not to requisition food from the population, not to carry out any agitation in favour of the fascist regime, and notify us about all the orders and instructions of the higher administration, as well as about the deployment and intentions of the police and counter-counter-counter-counter-counter-counter-counter-counter-counter-counter-counter. These and Groove accepted our conditions, and we told him to apply to the Okalai chief. This was already an evidence of our strength and authority, we left the house of Bai Tosho at midnight. His wife, Aunt Dotsa, an energetic and cordial woman, filled our knapsacks with freshly baked white bread, gave us a hefty lump of freshly beaten butter and apple jelly, carefully packed in a metal box, and we headed for Yalopsi. We found out about Dencho's relatives, who had also been deported, and then returned to the pine forest between Yalopsi and Radov, where we were to stay for three days. After yesterday's heavy rain, the ground was wet 
and there was a thick fog. We found a small hollow in the forest and made a fire. Densho was the closest to the fire. He was wearing new pants, a new cap and first-time shoes made of ox skin. Our faithful peasant women washed and cleaned Dencho and gave him clean clothes. Whoever sat around the fire in rainy, foggy weather can imagine what a pleasure it is to tell different stories and make pleasant memories in such an atmosphere. Dencho told us with excitement how he had become illegal, how his fellow villagers Georgi Belkov, Georgi Marinov, Stanko Jordanov had accompanied him to the Serbian village of Krivia Yabuka, how during the clash between the 2nd South Moravian detachment and the Bulgarian police, which took place on the very first night of his arrival in the detachment, he was almost killed by a partisan bullet. Densho was fully justified in this story by the Yugoslav partisans, because when they went into battle, he spoke Bulgarian, not Serbian, and many of the Yugoslavs did not know he was from their unit. Hands up! A Yugoslav fighter shouted sternly to him and pointed his rifle at him. The bewildered Densho obeyed and raised his hands. Only thanks to the Bulgarian partisan Trifon Balkansky, he remained alive. With great enthusiasm, Densho told us about him and about another Bulgarian partisan, Georgi Gelishev. Both of them had deserted from the Bulgarian occupation troops in Yugoslavia in 1942 and joined a partisan unit on the instructions of the memories of the cordial meeting with them in the detachment and of the combat friendship with the partisans of Radko Pavlovich brought Densho back to those days. Thinking, he fell silent, laid his head on his knees and fell asleep. Delcho and I also dozed off. But soon I was awakened by the smell of burning wool. Densho's new cap had fallen off his head into the fire and was already half burnt. I decided not to wake him up about it and tried to sleep again. How long we slept I don't know. But when I woke up Densho was burning again. This time he had burned the pant leg of his new pants. Now I not only woke him up, but also scolded him for his carelessness. Merslavo, don't scold me, he said pleadingly. I'm very sleepy. You may sleep, but who will buy you new clothes every time if you burn them so much? I answered mockingly. Densho was ashamed and fell silent. All of us were silent as well. Though it was dawn, the fog made it impossible to see anything even at a short distance. But we could clearly hear the creaking of the wagons. The men were already up and at work. Densho was also at work. He tried to mend his burned pants and sighed heavily. This task, which he would otherwise have left to his mother. The kindest grandmother Anna reminded him of her, of her gentle smile. Now extinguished by the fascists, who had expelled her, despite her advanced age and forced her, like a criminal, to sign her name three times a day, at the Okali police station in Svishtov. And what was she guilty of? Only that she had born and raised a son with an honest soul, ready to give himself entirely to the service of the people. When the party called him to fight for freedom, personal prosperity and peace of mind were a distant dream. He knew that if he took up arms, the fascist authorities would turn all their hatred against him on his relatives, but in this cruel time he could not do otherwise. We and our family had the honour to fight and suffer for the good of the people, and we were proud of it. Bencho realised that he could mend the hole himself. Away from his mother he had no choice but to take care of his clothes as best he could. It's okay if the stitches don't fit properly and the seam is rough, good or bad. It's what's soon that counts. That's a lesson to you, Delcho said. Next time you want to sleep, you will not put your feet in the fire. Stop scolding me, Gosho. I didn't do it on purpose. It's not enough that Slavo scolded me, now you're on me. Dencho was the youngest of the three of us, and therefore the favourite. Delcho and I were especially attentive to him. During the whole time of our guerrilla life, we never once quarrelled or insulted each other. Even serious remarks were often made in a joking manner, but this did not in the slightest way contribute to an unserious relationship. Our friendship was simple but real and full of deep meaning. There was a chance to eat. We ate until our stomachs refused to eat. If there was nothing to eat, we tightened our belts to the last hole. True to this rule, we unanimously decided to destroy everything that Aunt Dotsa had given us. Making ourselves comfortable, we opened our bags and without much difficulty, we devoured two loaves of white bread and all the butter, and only a little of the jam remained. Now if the police come, said Densho, it will be hard for us to escape, but they will not be able to get our food. Hmm, shut up, said Delcho, interrupting him suddenly. It sounded like a gunshot. You hear everything. 
Densho mocked him harmlessly and laughed. You laugh, but a joke may turn out to be true, said Delcho angrily. My ears do not deceive me. A shot was fired somewhere close by. Yes, they did. Densho mocked him again. Hmm. Cut it out, Densho. Be serious, Delcho said sternly. If your ears can't hear, clean them. All right, all right. I'm getting serious to hear your non-existent gunshots. At least I'm satisfied that I had plenty of hot bread and fresh butter, otherwise they could have been taken away by those shooting nearby, Densho replied and fell silent. Delcho was right. Not one, but several shots were heard from the direction of the Jarlovians. Now Densho believed it. The time was nearing noon. The fog had cleared. Through the gaps in the pine trees we could see pieces of fields, sections of mountains. A part of the road leading to Yolipsi was also visible. The shots became more frequent. They kept coming closer and closer to the forest, as if they were hunters raiding a beast. Only now Dencho and I became uneasy, that they were gunshots, that they were coming towards us. There was no doubt about that. But what was the purpose of this firing? Neither of us could explain. Yes. I proposed to hide our knapsacks and a box with jam in the bushes and get ready to reel in our fishing rods. It looks like we're surrounded, said Delcho. Delcho became serious at once. He silently took his rucksack, buried it under a pine tree and camouflaged it well. I stood there in utter bewilderment. It was hard to believe that we were surrounded. No one had seen us. At that time in the villages they play many weddings. And happy that I had found a clue, I hugged my comrades. What is it? They both asked me with a look. It's a wedding, brothers, a wedding. People are getting married, having fun, and you and I are frightened. Dencho was already inclined to agree with me, but Delcho continued to be an unbelieving Thomas. I the ancient reassure yourself that it's a wedding. Your procrastination will cost us, Delcho threw. At that time a group of boys and girls appeared on the road, out for a walk, and a drum echoed. Well, you see, Gosho, people are celebrating a wedding, and you are talking about the police and the police, said Delcho. If you get burned by milk, you blow on water too, replied Delcho and laughed loudly. On the way to the cheese factory in Algela, we stopped in Harohovica at Ain Jordanov's house, who provided us with everything we needed to destroy it, including an old axe. Delcho and I left ours in Radovo and took only our pistols with us, while Dencho also had a carbine. The cheese factory was located in a ravine at the upper end of the village. It was surrounded by tall, ancient oaks with lush crowns, whose huge branches not only covered the roof of the building, but almost touched the opposite slopes of the ravine. And how proud Lubash seemed from here. Having hidden the village in the rocky folds, it seemed to dream of growing even higher, of touching with its stone forehead the vast expanse of the sky, where only light clouds gilded by the setting sun were drifting. The smell of brinza let us know that the goal was near. Soon a fire glistened right in front of us, and several elderly figures were moving around it. One of the old men was saying something, and the others listened to him attentively, taking a drag of strong tobacco from time to time. They had no rifles. Some of them had long sticks in their hands, with which they raked the charcoal in the fire. How unpleasant it was for us to disturb the peaceful conversation of these people, who were nearing the end of their lives, but there was nothing to be done. The common interests of all the peasants, including themselves, demanded that we break the old man's peace and destroy the cheese factory as quickly as possible. The watchmen were kind and pliable, but the huge padlock that closed both doors of the cheese factory persisted for a long time in front of the axe. At last it flew aside and the doors opened. The warehouse was full of cheese. There was no cheese. Since we had limited time, we did not call the peasants to distribute the cheese, but decided to destroy it. The old men also rolled up their sleeves. Luck began. Some of them brought mothballs. Others sprinkled them on the cheese. Others rolled the tubs into the ravine. A strong knocking woke up the people in the neighboring houses. Twenty men and women came to help us, some with buckets, some with cauldrons. They were taking the brinza to their homes. I'll crush everything to hell, shouted a peasant. There's milk from my five sheep too. Genesee from your five sheep, but from my twenty-five answered another, and with all his might he threw the two-hundred-pound tub into the ravine. Let the damned Swabians chew on my postals. These words caused a general laugh. We did not notice how an hour passed. During this time the bottom of the ravine turned white with brinze. The air around smelled of mothballs. All the cauldrons were smashed to pieces. 
That was the end of our action. We taught the peasants how to behave with the police and bid them farewell. We also parted with Dencho. He had to return to the detachment, and Delcho and I went to the village of Baba. In Baba, we stopped at Bainidelko's house. The news of our affairs had reached here and excited old and small. Bainidelko rejoiced like a child. His faith in our final victory grew stronger day by day. The Filipovian headman was worried, too. He was anxious for his own fate and sought a way to find out the opinion of the partisans about his behaviour. We took advantage of the fact that Bai Nadelko had some connections with him, and we gave the headman the conditions under which he could continue to hold his post. He accepted them, and we left him alone. Bai Nadelko gathered the village party group to inform the party members about our action in Lyalinsi, as a result of which several other villages, including Baba Village, were exempted from milk requisitioning. Now even here the people felt the help of the partisans, and perhaps this was the reason why the meeting was very active. The mood of the communists was evident in their smiles and strong handshakes. After the meeting, taking a jug of water and bread from by Nadelko, we went into the field and took shelter in the rye. It was safer there, but we could hardly stand the heat. All day long the sun poured streams of fiery rays on us, and when at last it disappeared over the horizon, the heat began to rise in waves from the heated earth. In the evening we moved on to the village of Yaroslavsi. We had to meet Todor M. Ladinov, and if the situation was favourable, we had to destroy the cheese factory there. After the action in Lyalinsi, we could expect the police to become alarmed and to increase the security of cheese factories and community offices. This required us to be as prudent as possible. We reached the Jaroslavtsev cheese factory at sunrise. Some people were walking around near it, but the thick willow trees on the banks of the rivulet did not allow us to see them, and to adjust our shoes. We stopped near the cheese factory and looked carefully at the two roads that joined near it. One was the one we had come on, and the other, along the river, led to the village of Bilinci. We heard the clicking of rifle bolts, and through the trunks of willows we saw that a group of peasants had moved along the road towards the village, and only two people remained near the cheese factory whom we could not understand whether they were policemen or civil servants. When the peasants were out of sight, a fat man came out of the cheese factory and almost ran down the road towards Bilinci. When he noticed that we were watching him, he ran back to the cheese factory. We realised that we seemed suspicious and quickly followed the road to the village, which was near the cheese factory. Our aim was to get ahead of him in case he had any evil intentions against us. The buttons of a policeman gleamed among the willows. The fat man standing beside him was evidently a cheesemaker. As we approached him, the policeman asked us who we were. We told him calmly that we were travellers, but just in case we had our pistols in our jacket pockets. Delcho carried my raincoat, my bag with food and barber's tools. Hmm, come here, ordered the policeman. We're in a hurry. We don't have time. I replied and signalled Delcho to run over to the nearest stone fence. Delcho ran, followed by me. The policeman loaded his rifle and fired into the air. Delcho tossed the bag into the nearest vegetable garden so that it wouldn't get in his way, and turned to the left. There were a lot of fruit trees here. I followed him, but to confuse the policeman, I turned further to the left, where the trees were thicker and we were out of sight. As I followed Delcho, I heard a second, third, fifth shot. Delcho had fallen. I thought he was wounded and stopped, but he quickly jumped up and ran again. It looked as if he had just slipped. Delcho didn't have my cloak. It was already lying on the ground far behind him under one of the plum trees. After running a few more steps, Delcho unlocked the safety of the grenade and tossed it in the direction from which the policeman's shots were coming. I waited for an explosion, but the grenade didn't go off. The policeman kept firing. To the north of the vegetable garden stood several houses. In one of these houses lived by Isaiah R. Yatok, with whom Todor Madinov had put me in touch and whom I had visited many times in the fall and winter. When the villagers' men, women and children heard the shooting, they jumped out of their houses to see what was going on. Run to the forest, boys, to the forest, shouted a familiar voice. It was Stanka, Ba is A's daughter. Without answering her, I kept running towards the forest. I tried to find Delcho, but in vain he was out of sight and I did not even know in what direction to look for him. Left alone, I decided to get far away from here and headed toward Bresnik. I crossed several dried up rivers and came out on a highway. It led me almost to the village of Girolo. I went around the village and entered the bread. 
Here I sat the whole day, eating sour plums, and in the evening, when the Bresnians were returning from the fields, I wandered towards the town with them. It was safer to go to Bay Lazo's house at daylight than at night. I took a bundle of hay under my arm, broke off a stick, pressed the hay with it, and, keeping to the river all the time, reached the house of Bardezo. Both he and his wife were at first surprised that I came to them at such a time. They thought that after his arrest none of us would look for a meeting with him any more. Run, brother, shouted by Lazo when he saw me. I'm under surveillance, or you'll be caught. Run quickly. Don't be afraid. By Lazo, the police are not so all-powerful and all-knowing, and party business must be carried out under all circumstances. Hey, I understand, but these are the times we live in. We must beware, said by Lazo. When I told him about our affairs in Trine District, Bailezo smiled. He was ashamed of his fearfulness, he felt guilty. Hey, the time has come to strike at these bastards in Bresniki Okolia as well. They've gotten too loose here, he said. We will strike soon, Bailezo, but you too hold the front tighter. Yes, hold it, he said firmly. We are waiting for a little help from you. You'll get it. That same night, I went to Resnik. I tried to find out about Delcho, but nobody knew anything about him. The next evening I held a meeting here, although I could hardly gather my thoughts. The anxiety about my comrade did not leave me for a minute. After the meeting I sat on the straw in Boris's barn and thought about Delcho. Most of all I was tormented by the unknown. What could have happened to him? What if he was ambushed or surrounded somewhere near the village and killed? The guesses one more terrible than the other tore my brain. They did not one, Consulex. They did not say anything of the kind in the village, and if they did not say it, it meant that nothing bad had happened yet. Just as I was trying to push these thoughts away, I heard footsteps near the barn. The door creaked open, and without any signal a large figure appeared at the door Delcho. Oh, oh, Gosho, are you alive? I shrieked, forgetting for joy that anyone could hear me, and rushed to embrace him. He hugged me too. We kissed, happy to be together again and decided to go straight to Sophia. The next evening I showed up at the place where I was scheduled to meet with Comrade Yakim, but for some reason he did not show up, nor did he come to the other appearance. Boris Novansky, a member of the military leadership of the zone, did not show up for the agreed meeting with Delcho. My apartment on Odrian Street and the house in Ovchikupeli, where I was hiding, were under police surveillance. The atmosphere was suddenly very grave. It was evident from everything that something bad had happened to our leaders. One evening I went to the Manskov's house to spend the night. Evda met me at the door with alarming words. Go away, we're being watched. So I left. I couldn't risk it. But where to go? Maybe to Kalista Peshev? I thought and walked down of Chakupal Boulevard. Peshev lived in house number eight with his parents. Grandfather George and grandmother Erina and his brother Alexander. We knew each other well. These were our people. I had never spent the night with them before, but I thought they would not refuse me. You can't spend the night with us, said Callister. Responsible comrades come here, and I have orders not to let anyone else in. Otherwise, there could be a failure. And indeed, as I later learned, Vlado Trichkov, Tesola Dragoisheva, all from the Central Party and military leadership, were hiding here. I had to recall again all the possible apartments to figure out where it was safer and where I could be accepted, because not everyone was willing to make sacrifices. I headed for Vasil Petrov's. I went straight through the meadows to the Krasno Selo neighborhood. The meadows were mowed and the hay was gathered in bales. I looked at my watch. It was midnight. I remembered that at that hour we had parted with Dencho at the share in Eugelimsi, and it reminded me of his one wish to acquire a watch. This became my first concern for the next day. The air was saturated with the odour of hay. I involuntarily recalled my childhood, when my greatest pleasure was to sleep on hay or grass. Why shouldn't I sleep on hay today, sheltering in the nearby bushes? And there's no danger of being arrested, and there's no need to bother anyone. Sleeping in the hay was indeed fabulous. Never before in my illegal life had I slept so peacefully and so sweetly. When I awoke in the morning, my clothes were damp with dew and my lungs seemed flushed. The day was going to be a difficult one. I had to get in touch with some of the important comrades in the party leadership at any cost. Delcho and I poked back and forth, but all our attempts for several days were fruitless. It turned out that Comrade Yakim had been arrested 
and Boris Novansky had been killed. We had to look for outsiders connected with the party or the RMs. This is how we met Zdryko Georgiev, who was the chief of staff of the zone, through him a little later. We also contacted the district leadership of the party. At night after the destruction of the cheese factory in Leila, Dencho went again to Essen Yordanov's house in Glogovitsa. Only he fell asleep when he was awakened by daughter. A man in tourist clothes was standing near the Koshara. He's looking for someone from the partisans. What did you say to him? Dencho asked in his sleep and loaded his Montenegrin pistol. I, I said that I hadn't seen any partisans and I didn't know where they were. I answered him well. Did he leave? No. He's waiting for me to show him Sotia's house. All right. Show him. But make sure you see where he goes. The daughter went out into the yard again and showed the tourist the house of Sotia Todorov, who at that time was a teacher in the town. Only his two brothers, Stoyan and Sazdo, both members of the party organization, lived in the house. Stoyan was a tailor. I had my own workshop in the village, and Sazdo was in charge of the household. Tourist picked on Sazdo. They talked and talked, but Sazdo never trusted him. He took the guest to a nearby thicket of bushes for the night with the intention of notifying Densho about this man and getting the necessary instructions on how to proceed. The tourist called himself Slavcho Tesetkov. This was the same Slav show who had accompanied me on my first detour to Trenska Okia. Densho had heard about him from me, but he did not know him personally, and Stefan and I had not told him anything about Ketkov's unworthy behavior. Densho did not know that he had left his wife and two children and lived illegally with some Julia, nor did he know about a number of his other weaknesses. The very fact that Slavcho was looking for the partisans pleased Densho, and he waited impatiently for it to get dark. In the evening he went to meet him but decided to take some precautions just in case. Keeping his gun at the ready, he hid himself in the bushes near the road by which Setkov was to go. From the direction of the village two men appeared. When they had both equaled the shrubbery and Densho was convinced that there was no deception here, he went out to them. The meeting was joyous. They embraced and could not be happy with each other. From Hlalovica Densho, together with Setkov, went to Jarlovsi where Stefan was to wait for him observing the partisan principle of not telling everything at once to a new man. Deko spoke to Fetkov with some caution. He expected that Stefan would be even more pleased with Tivetkov than he was, since they were not only fellow villagers, but also relatives. Not reaching Brejanov's spring, the place of their meeting, Densho left Tivetkov, approached the spring and gave the agreed signal. A duckling cackled and Stefan sprang out from behind a shrubbery. Impatient to share the good news with him, Densho shouted to him from afar, Stefan, we have destroyed the cheese factory of Liljela too, and he told him briefly how everything had gone. Then he told him the second happy news. I have brought a new partisan, Slavcho Tetsvetkov, from your village. Nislavcho, what does he want here, that coward? Why did you bring him here? Don't you know how the commander feels about him? No, I don't. Why? Densho asked in surprise. Stefan told him about Tetkov's desertion, how he had used the funds intended for the exiles for his personal needs, and insisted that Densho send him back. Ito found himself in a delicate position. He could not help but listen to what Stefan had told him, but he was also uncomfortable sending Setkov back. Feeling guilty, Densho began to persuade Stefan that Setkov had reformed. After all, he had come here on his own initiative, and this showed that he realized his previous mistakes and after all, they could leave him until my return and then decide the issue of him collectively. Stefan agreed, but before going to get Setkov, Densho asked Stefan to be, though he was uncomfortable with it, with Setkov more friendly, so that he would not get the impression of an unfriendly reception. No matter how hard Stefan tried to fulfill his request, he still could not conceal his indignation against the man who, in his heart, he so condemned. He felt that it was too difficult for him to forgive Setkov the misdeeds which the party condemned most severely. Only a few days had passed since Dencho and Stefan had met Slavcho Tetsvitkov, but during this time there had already been more than once disputes between them, mainly over the activity of the partisans. Back in Sofia Tizivkov heard talk that the detachment has hundreds of fighters, that the guerrillas have entire warehouses of food and clothing, that they only lie down and eat. Tempted by such a paradise life, he decided to go to Trinska Okokia, where only a year ago he had given up organizational work, 
preferring to stay in Sofia, and now, having barely joined the partisan routine endless transitions, malnutrition, constant police harassment, ambushes and incessant rain, he was again disappointed, and once, what are we? Nothing. Our lives are blacker than those black crows. Constant raids and ambushes, you can't take a step in peace. Wouldn't it be better to go into hiding somewhere and sit tight for a while? What? Hide out? Stefan jumped on him. So you recommend hiding from the people, burrowing in the ground and waiting for someone to bring us freedom? We don't think so, and those who can't bear hardship should stay away from us. We didn't drag you to us by force. You came. So stop your talk about ambushes. You won't sway us. Stefan's anger frightened Sitkov. He felt that the scythe had found a stone and was silent. But his silence did not mean agreement. Binan of the squadron was one unfulfilled point. We have not yet punished the tax collector Sonia Dordanov from the village of Yelopsi, which meant that the sentence must be executed as soon as possible. While Delcho and I were in Sofia, Dencho and Stefan decided to organize his capture or leave. After the execution of the Hetman Trichikov, Sonia Yordanov attempted to move to Trine, but Dragilov and Baikushev did not allow him to do so, because they said that his escape would reflect badly on the rest of the local administration, and he was forced to stay in the village. Although the tax collector had not slept at home for a long time and was guarded by the deputy headman and his own son, this did not save him. On July 28, at dawn, our boys took refuge in an unfinished house on the outskirts of Yalopsi, just off the road by which Stonya Yordanov usually returned. The house was uninhabited, but the boys climbed into the attic just in case. Here they spent the whole day. When the hand of the clock approached six, Dencho and Stefan carefully descended to the first floor, and Setkov remained in the attic. His him was also a knapsack with apples, which they had picked at night in Leshnikov's orchards. Without realizing what he was doing, he threw some apple stumps through the skylight. The stumps fell near a couple in love who were alone on the lawn near the house and attracted their attention. The young people thought someone was following them and raised a shout. Dencho and Stefan became alarmed. They thought their presence had been revealed and froze when they realized that the cause of the screams was apple nibbles. Dencho went up to the attic, warned T. Vetkov and told him to go downstairs. The tax collector's two-horse appeared on the road on the Irma side. It was rapidly approaching the outskirts of the village. The fattened horse easily carried three men. The tax collector, the deputy headman, his bodyguard and his son, who drove the horse, were in the two-horse carriage. Our written warning to Sonia Yordanov alarmed his family and friends. Last night Yordanov's brother had a bad dream. As if he had been bitten in the right leg by an adder and a lot of blood came out. According to the interpretation of the dream book, which was under his pillow, it meant that someone close to him would die. The man who believed in dreams decided without any hesitation that bad things would happen to Tsonyo, and tried to tell him on the phone not to come home. But it was too late. Sonyo Yordav was already on his way. The double carriage drew up in front of the house. At this time Stefan and Tsetkov were lying in the weeds with rifles at the ready, and Densho was standing outside the house. Ten paces separated him now from Sonyo sitting in the two-horse with a carbine in his hands. Beside him sat the deputy headman. When the tax collector met Densho's gaze, his hands shook and he was confused. A second after Densho's command, Stefan gave a long line from his automatic rifle. Sonyo Yordanov released his carbine and leaned forward. Both his bodyguards crouched and the frightened horse galloped away. It raced through the whole village and no one could stop it. At Yordanov's house she stopped herself, but medical aid was unnecessary. The dreary ringing of the bell was heard. The peasants at once guessed what was the matter and heaved a sigh of relief. When Dencho's grandfather Tosho Stoyanov, a fellow villager, met our boys in the field and shout, Well, guys, did you send Mussolini to the other world? Tosho's grandfather called the tax collector Mussolini. Hmm, sent. Hmm, Dencho replied. Edgy be alive and well. We've been spared a great evil. The next day the police pursued the guerrillas and set up many ambushes. Without knowing anything about this action, Delcho and I and a group of underground guerrillas from Sofia went straight to a huge overgrown tree by the roadside, which was only two kilometers from the village of Bokova. We calculated that the newcomers would spend two days in the vicinity of my village, and during this time we would find the rest of the partisans 
Gather them all together and begin actions against the fascist administration. Some of our partisans were in the territory of Okolija, some in the territory of the Yugoslav partisans. Comrades Vado Tikolov, Trico Filipov, his wife Danka, Christo Spasov, Elena Argirova, Peter Shkutov, Alexander Vasilev came with us. These comrades were handed over to us by Zedravko Georgiev. Almost none of them had weapons, only Delcho and I had weapons. This obliged us to move with extreme caution, observing complete When we climbed a steep hill that covered a huge tree we had long ago recognized from the east, I gave the command to stop. We made a short halt, and during this time we agreed with Delcho that he would go to Aunt Boshana, who had our lamb. Delcho would stab it, cook the food, and Aunt Bojana would bring it to us in Jasenica, where Delco himself would arrive. In addition to this place, we had also agreed on Dis and Cladonets. I had met Densho there in June. This point was on the Great Rudina, near the Yugoslav villages of Kalna and Kravina Jabuka. We were separated from Bohova only by the crest of the mountain, the spur of which led directly to Aunt Bazana's house. On the eastern side of the ridge was the road that connected the villages of Sigrilosi and Upper Melna. The peasants used it to transport firewood for heating. Almost all along the road it passed through a beech forest. Only around the huge tree we saw there were pine trees planted by foresters. Delcho had not gone 500 meters when a machine gun rumbled out of the woods. I and my group immediately turned in the opposite direction and descended into the brush to the south of the branching tree. We had undoubtedly run into an ambush of Contras. That's how the people dubbed the fascist mercenaries from the Contrachet who fought against the partisans. Noticing that we had veered away from the road, they came out of the forest to fire on us, but we were already in a dead space. Although we had already moved far away from the ambush site, the Contras continued firing until dawn. They believed that we were somewhere quite close. This prevented Delcho from going to Aunt Bojana, and our original plan had to be changed. Instead of Jasenica, I took the group to the area around the village of Upper Melna. In this village I knew Mitko Kirov, but he was in prison at the time. True, another family I knew lived in the neighboring Mahala. I stayed with them several times in the fall and winter of 1942. It was the family of my gymnasium classmates Milan Georgiev, who had taken over the secretariat after the secretary of the village party organization, Stoyan Georgiev, had fled to Sofia, afraid of being taken into the detachment. He was a teacher in a neighboring village, and this favored party work. Both of Milan's brothers, Mitko Kirov's fellow student Stoyan and Zakari, were members of the RMS, but they too were frightened by the arrests and lacked the courage to become partisans, and their brother Milan soon did the same as his predecessor. Stojan had recently been arrested, and the only person representing the village organization we could lean on was Zakaria's. I contacted Zakaria's and left the group of newcomers in his care for a few days, while I went with Shikov to Dishin Cladence, where Delcho and I had an appointment. From there we were to go together in search of a detachment of Yugoslav partisans to pick up the partisans who remained there. This detachment was now commanded by Milicic. With Delcho we met on August 1. On that day a large group of American flying fortresses subjected Romania's oil center of Ploesti to a brutal bombing raid. Romania was a satellite of Germany, Romanian oil power, German industry and military equipment thrown against the Soviet Union. I confess we rejoiced at this ruthless bombardment. In the evening the three of us reached the village of Kravina Yabuka. With the help of a trusted man, we contacted Milicic. Milicic and his detachment were at that time in the village of Radisin. The commander of the detachment correctly understood the political events and the general goals of the struggle. He had an excellent impression of the Bulgarian partisans. They showed courage and determination during the fighting and thereby won well-deserved authority among the Yugoslav partisans and Milik himself. When parting, many even wept and Milik said to me, Srend Kolo, very sorry to part with your partisans. They are excellent fighters and Bulgarians in general fight well. I got both groups together. All that remained was for Dencho, Stefan, and Setkov to join us. The meeting with them was to take place on one of the following days. We had plenty of time, and so we all stayed for a week in the vicinity of the village of Upper Melna on the allowance of the Mahara of Trikovsi. We camped near a big bend in the highway trine Volcha Poriana, Nishnaya Melna. In these high mountainous places, where even in August it was cool, and at night it was simply cold, the fog often lay down. 
it would lie motionless on flat places, and by noon, when the sun dispersed it, it would lazily creep up and then stretch along the high slopes for a long time. At the time when the shroud of fog was tightly pressed to the ground, the prohibition to light fires did not apply. We hastily gathered dry twigs, and a flame flared up, providentially blocked from all sides by partisans. We made a fire that time too. A pleasant warmth spilled around, everyone's faces flushed, and immediately the kettle for Mamaliga stood on two large stones, hammered on both sides of the fire. The water boiled quickly and by Trico, our most experienced cook, poured in the cornmeal. When it had boiled, he stirred it, put in the butter, crumbled the brinza, and the maliga was ready. Though before starting to eat, it was necessary to fetch fresh water. It was by Trico's turn to go for water. Although he was only forty years old, he looked much older. The hard life of a poor man had made him so short, thin, but hardened by hardships. By Trico quickly got used to the long crossings. From the first days he showed everyone an example of a strong-willed fighter, an inveterate smoker who never let go of a cigarette. He immediately quit smoking when we explained to him the risks involved in supplying cigarettes and smoking itself. We were amazed. I remember at one time my father quit smoking, and his eyes were puffy and his lips were chapped. Some of our smokers said that they could do without bread, but they could not do without tobacco. But by Trico quit smoking at once, we respected him also for the fact that he came to the detachment together with his wife. They left their only child in the care of their parents. Danka, his wife, was modest and silent, the complete opposite of the chatty Elena Argirova, who often began to talk about her acquaintances with responsible comrades, which was completely wrong, and therefore she not without reason caused indignation and criticism of the other partisans. Who asks you who you know and who you don't know? sometimes interrupted her ranting fighters. Who is worth and what is capable of what? We just find out now. Danka, who also did not approve of Elena's talkativeness, made friends with Setse, Bonka and Violeta, who were much more reserved and modest. Here, amid the everyday difficulties of the first days of their life together, the characters of all the partisans were unmistakably revealed. Ardo Nikolov, or by Zakari, as we called him in the detachment, was a lonely bachelor. Shy and a bit withdrawn, he always sat away from women and therefore was tacitly declared a misogynist. Hurt by his oddities, some women often teased him. Especially sharp clashes occurred between him and Elena Argirova. They never spoke in a friendly tone. It was always not a conversation, but a verbal skirmish in which each sought to hurt the other as much as possible. And when bade Zacharias, in order to hurt, said that because of her he was ready to hate all women, Lena, without answering him, began to laugh defiantly, but her laughter angered him no less than the sharpness. And then, already in irritation, he said, You women should not go to us and sit at home, have children, raise them. And fighting is a man's business, not a woman's. For some reason now Lena came to buy Zakari and sat down next to him. He told her to move to another seat, but she didn't want to, and an altercation began. Go away from here. Miscouted by Zacharias, already angry. Eh, I'm not leaving. I want to sit with you, Elena replied ironically. It's you who want to, but I don't want to. Go away from here, he repeated. Lena did not listen. Everyone became animated. Some sided with by Zacharias and others. Sometimes, when the comrades were bored, they themselves tried to cause a peak between Lena and by Zacharias and amuse themselves with it. Engrossed either in their own work or in the humorous bickering between Lena and Baizakare, we did not pay attention to the fact that Baytrico was still gone. Slim, agile, in lightweight shoes, he should have returned long ago. But where has Baytrico disappeared to? Someone suddenly asked. Mamaliga is getting cold and he still does not come. Some began to make jokes about the fact that he had decided to make ablutions before eating. Others, that he had slipped in his posts. Others, that he had gone to Sofia. If Lena was so interested in the road to the Zemen station, why didn't Bayou Trico go back? Snidely teased Alexander Vasilev, who chose his partisan name Ognyan. Enough, Lena shouted angrily. You can't even joke. You'd immediately pick on... And the fact that you want to seduce one Melik Shanin, is this also a joke? Baizakarius turned to her. No, not a joke. I never vowed to get married. If I meet a good guy, why don't I seduce him? 
who'd take you. If I'd never even seen another woman, I wouldn't marry you. And I'd never marry a man like you. You're not a man. You're a walking anger. You better take care of your diabetes. You can't find more anger than you, concluded by Zacharias and stood up. What do your arguments look like, comrades? Delcho intervened in the conversation. You start with jokes and end with bickering. Who wants to make jokes about others? He himself must understand and tolerate jokes. You, Lena, shouldn't tease by Zachariah. He is twice our age, and age demands that he be treated with respect. While Delcho was talking, I sent some men to look for by Trico. They searched for him for a long time, but could not find him anywhere. Neither in the ravine where the rivulet flowed, nor on the path that led there, was there any trace of him. Our numerous signals were answered only by echoes. Everyone became alarmed. Danko was the most worried, and the assumption of some comrades that Baj Trako had deserted offended the modest and good-natured woman. No, comrades, she assured them. I know how eager Trico was to join the party, and I cannot suppose that he could have decided to do such a despicable thing. Whether you do or not is not important. If he's not here, then where is he? Again pestered her. Dyker cried. She lowered her head in shame. The fact remained and she was powerless to prove otherwise, though she was ashamed to think that her trico could have done such an abomination. I took Danker aside and asked her about her relationship with her husband, about his weaknesses, about his feelings for the child, but she answered all my questions positively. Danka respected her husband and asked us not to rush to judgment. She herself was lost in conjecture. She considered it quite acceptable that he had gotten lost in the forest, and then she refuted herself, saying that it was impossible for a man to get lost at such a close distance and on a well-travelled path. But however improbable his escape seemed to us, we had to take the necessary precautions. The case of Mordokai had taught us that. I gave orders to distribute lunch to all and to gather up the We could find another place to camp here. Just as we were about to set out, someone shouted joyfully, Hey, bye, Trico, welcome. Where have you been? I got lost, damn it. And Trechko replied, angry with himself. Happy that they were wrong in their guesses, everyone rushed to him. Only Danka did not move. She was deeply grieved by his negligence and could find neither compassion nor joy in herself. After a week's stay, we left our bivouk and headed for Yanichiva Chuka, a small hill west of my village, where the old Bulgarian Yugoslavian border ran and where, like a bird on a branch, a dilapidated border post perched. There, the meeting with Dencho Stefan and Setkov was appointed. After a short wait, the comrades came. Our detachment now numbered sixteen men. Dencho and Stefan immediately complained to me about the behaviour of Setkov. I decided to put the question of him to the discussion of the whole squad, especially since there was something else to find out about Setkov. In a small clearing in the vicinity of the village Kostroshopsi, the first meeting of our detachment took place. The only item on the agenda was Setyov's behaviour. I formed comrades about his desertion from work in August 1942, and his behaviour in the partisan detachment and his abuse of party funds were reported by Stefan and Dencho. Although Tivsvetkov tried in every way to deflect all accusations from himself, the facts were obvious and all comrades, without exception, were outraged at his cowardice, weak character and self-love. For a communist there is no greater sin than to abuse party funds, to use them for his own needs and deceive comrades, saying that they were spent on the maintenance of political prisoners, and Tetkov did just that. If he did not get rid of his shortcomings, he would be tried for similar offences the next time. Everyone was impressed by the principle of Stefan. Although Tid Setkov was his cousin, Stefan criticised him in the highest degree of objectivity, without sparing his feelings of kinship. By sunset, the whole detachment was in the Mahal of Storkichov, one and a half kilometres from the village of Kostroshopsi. Here lived our faithful Yatark Isaac Zakhariev. He was my father's kinsman, and thanks to this kinship, I, having gone to an illegal position, spent some days in his house in the winter of 1942. And later, after our action in the village of Jinchopsi, when we poured milk and were leaving the police who tortured the shepherds Bozhyurka and Senko, the four of us came to Bay Isaac, took food from him and went up into the mountains. Bay Isaac gave the impression of a man of fearlessness and intelligence. Now we saw him for the third time. I gave him some materials, inquired about the work in the village, and then, for the first time, without hiding, held a meeting. 
We and the peasants were very interested in it. Not only adults, but also children and old people came. Almost half of the village was gathered. They had seen the partisans for the first time and were curious to hear what we had to say. The meeting took place in the orchard. The partisans and peasants sat on the grass. Only our guards were standing. It was the first time I spoke in front of such a large gathering, and I was nervous. I was afraid to say something I shouldn't have said. Every word I said had to be calibrated precise. The first difficulty I had to overcome was the address. Should I call them comrades or simply peasants? The first word expressed a great closeness, but perhaps not every one of them shared our views, and the second emphasised our difference. The meeting went well, Dencho said as we left the village. While you were talking, the people didn't move, but they liked it best when you spoke out against the requisitions. The base is expanding, Delcho put in. If we always get this kind of welcome, it'll be great, and they gave us plenty of food. No. Food is important, of course, but even more important is the attitude it expresses. Did you notice that the hardest part was whoever decided to give it first? As soon as Bai Isaac gave us bread, all his neighbours rushed to get food. Only Bai Isaac would not have suffered. I don't believe it, Delcho said with conviction. The people here are good. There is a lousy sheep in every flock, Stefan said. Even among us there are some... Everyone immediately thought of Mordokai, and Stefan looked at his cousin, who was far ahead, and a shadow passed over his face. Stefan was right, of course. The relatives of Kosta Ivanov, a well-known rich businessman, lived in Stolkichev, and they were the ones who could notify the police. The others had seen nothing good from the authorities, so they could not be expected to do anything bad. This was evident from the cordial wishes and invitations when we left the Mahala. Come, come. We will be waiting for you. The peasants shouted and waved at us. And we promised them to come again. Enough time passed. We watched with bated breath to see if anything would happen to Bai Isaac, but fortunately nothing bad happened to him. What stopped the scoundrel fear, or there was no such person in this village? The hospitality of the Kostroshovs was unexpected for us, and probably that's why this manifestation of people's love warmed us for so long. From the Makaula, the detachment moved to Kalani Valog, a vast mountain plain covered with beech groves. Once my fellow villagers used to feed large herds of cattle and small horned cattle on the meadows. Several streams flowed through the Kalani Valog, which merging gave rise to the Ermi River, which absorbed dozens of other similar mountain rivulets. We found a convenient place for washing and bathing near one of these rivulets and unloaded our luggage. Stefan set up nearer and far watches and Delcho distributed the men by shifts. No one was allowed to undress, bathe, or do laundry at once. Razors, soap, needles, thread. Everything went to work. The clearing became like a barber shop. The same strong smell of cologne, and the light of bright electric lamps replaced the glow of the sun. The best master of hair cutting showed himself by Zacharias. The machine danced in his hands, obediently turning to one side or the other, in a short time at his table, a large stone crew a whole pile of colourful hair. Razor squeaked. The soap was foaming and the washing was in full swing. In a few hours, to the envy of those who feared the hardships of partisan life, and to the surprise of the village girls, the soldiers of the detachment became even cleaner, even neater. Shaved. Just look at the guys. Trimmed, shaved, even smelling of perfume. Again the village girls will say behind our back. Indeed, we sometimes had cologne. The modest partisan budget did not provide for it. It usually came to us together with new recruits, and as soon as it appeared, it immediately became public property. We had not yet finished bathing when a herd appeared a little further down the river. The shepherd was nowhere to be seen. He must have been confident in the obedience of the sheep and was sitting somewhere in the shade. Bay Trico, who was on watch in this direction, tried to drive the sheep carefully to the forest without disturbing the shepherd. But the sheep, thirsty, moved stubbornly towards the swift stream. When he tried to drive them away a second time, two huge braided dogs pounced upon him, and the more he fought them off, the fiercer they came at him. A shepherd came to his aid, a bearded old man of about seventy. With a few words he made the dogs tuck their tails and go away with a guilty look. I ordered the shepherd to be detained until we were ready to leave. A little while later Baitrey came up to me and whispered, Hmm. Comrade Commander, this old man is from your village, 
His name is Grandfather Rangel. Grandpa Rangel. What did he lose here? I asked, not realizing that all this forest and meadows around it are the property of Grandfather Rangel. Although I hadn't seen Grandpa Rangel for a long time, he recognized me immediately. The old man looked at me with undisguised joy, embraced me, and spoke through his tears. Oh, Slavo, oh, Slav show, the police are looking for you everywhere, and you don't give a damn about it. You bathe and do your laundry, and you don't give a damn. Eager to do us some favor, Grandpa Rangel told us in great detail everything that was being said in the village, and we gave him a good haircut and shave. The old man immediately became different, younger, smelling of color. After making Grandfather Rangel look human, we let him go away, asked him to do a few errands for us and agreed to meet him again the next day. In the evening, Grandfather Rangel came down with his herd to his Mahala, all of its. It was situated at the foot of Janikov Chuka and consisted of four or five houses in which his three sons lived. His fourth son, Peter, moved to Sophia. Cheap, the Grandfather Rangel herded belonged not only to him, he also herded strangers, so in the evening there was a great excitement near the sheep pen, which was a little away from the village. When Grigor, Rangel's grandfather's eldest son, came to the pen, he could not believe his eyes. What happened to his father? He became completely different. He looked, looked, he grinned. Why did the old man shave on a weekday? But at once his face took on a worried look. He ducked down to his father's ear, Father, you left early in the morning overgrown and unshaven, and now you even smell a perfume. What barber shaved you? Well, whoever shaved me, shaved me. None of your business, said the old man. I'm asking you in a human way. Why are you angry? I know there is no barber shop in the mountains. Maybe there is, said Rangel's grandfather and whispered quietly to his son. Slavcho shaved me. He sends his greetings to you, but don't tell anyone about it, and don't tell your mother. She's a woman, after all, she'll tell. Grigor didn't ask his father any more questions, but he waited impatiently for them to come home to find out the details. At home, Grandfather Rangel told his son about everything and ordered him to prepare two pairs of leather tables and hemp ropes. Now it is a tomorrow I will meet Slavcho again. You should go to the village and find out all the news. They are interested in what is said about them and all the movements of the police. One evening they will come to us too he told his son. Let them come. Grigor approved and in turn reminded his father not to trust anyone else. In the morning, before putting the sheep out to pasture, Grigor gathered all the news and told it to his father. Grigor had once been a member of the bourgeois democratic conspiracy. He did not understand anything about politics. He thought that if he enrolled in some ruling party, he could get some benefits. And when he saw that there was no service, he, like Gurosimov, left the party. Now that the partisan movement was born to defend the interests of the people, both former conspirators took the movement as their own and devoted their lives and the lives of their families to serving it. They helped us to the very end, until the armed struggle was over. They were not communists and therefore not registered with the police as unreliable, so the Nazis could not suspect them of anything. So Grandpa Rangel's cramped house became our warehouse and technical base. Our August plan was quite intense. It envisioned dozens of political and military actions, the purpose of which was, on the one hand, to frighten the enemy and, on the other hand, to attract new adherents. At the same time, each action provided an opportunity to arm ourselves. At the end of the month, we already had several spare rifles. They were intended for the new guerrillas we were waiting for and who were bound to join our ranks. Where can I go now? Aunt Bashana asked before I could say hello to her. This Jono Panin has already sneered several times that I have become a partisan, that my house has turned into an outlaw den. Can't you take away the ducats he brought back from the war? Look how many stores he's got. A store in the village, a store in Glavanovsky's inn. Soon he'll buy up the whole Trine district with stolen ducats. Don't worry, Aunt Bojana, we reassured her. We won't take his worms, but we'll make him shut his mouth. Well, as you like. As long as he doesn't poke my eyes, said Aunt Bajana with a sigh, and only at that moment she realized and invited me to sit down. At that time our group was in the tract of Teskovec, south of my village. We agreed with Dencho and Delcho and went to Panin's house. His house, along with several others, was at the edge of the village, somewhat out of the way. Before dark, the guerrilla column made its way through the orchard, 
fenced off by a high wattle, and found itself in the yard behind Panin's house. The neighbor's dogs raised such a bark that the whole village immediately became aware of our arrival. The partisans came to the Panin's house, they said by word of mouth. We wanted everyone to know that the partisans had visited his house. We when we entered his house, the old field Fabel was shaking all over. He thought we were going to kill him. As soon as we showed up at the door, he begged us to let him live. We didn't come to kill you, Densho said. We came to make friendship with you. You are a rich man, you have money, you have bread and other things. And we, as you know, are poor, in need of help. Help, not charity, he explained. What I can, I will help. Panin replied more calmly. God has given me both bread and cheese. Uh, no, God didn't give you the cheese, said by Zacharias. If it were not for us, you would have neither cheese nor butter. That's right, that's right. You are our saviors. May you be fat and healthy for a thousand years. Panin's wife, a tall, waxen-faced woman, gleamed with her gold teeth and took it up obsequiously. Bread and brinza are no problem for us, Papa, said Dencho. Money, money we need. How much can you lend us? Oh, I don't have any money. I gave everything I had saved to my old age to my children. Slavcho knows that we're poor. Until now I've been silent. I let Dencho and Delcho do the talking, but since Yono pretended to be poor and decided to take me as a witness, I responded. You are not the richest man in the Oakley, but you could give us twenty or thirty thousand against a receipt. We will borrow them from you, not just for nothing. Thirty thousand, shrieked like a stung old field felon. Where am I going to get so much money? Where? From the money you looted during the war. Oh, Slavsho nephew, it's all nonsense. Where will we get such money? You know how poor we live. I know, aunt, I know that you were poor while you had to hide those worms, but as soon as you brought them out into the light of day, you live differently, you live beautifully. No, oh, God, hear you say that. God grant you to break out of this cursed poverty. My aunt Matza continued to duplicitous. After much exhortation, you know Panin untied a knot with banknotes and counted out ten thousand. That's it, no more, <coughs> he said, almost crying. If you're so sorry for this money, we won't take it. You're lending it to us, not giving it to us. Dencho cut him off and handed him a receipt. Here, take it. Yan Panin took the receipt with trembling hands and began to read the folds. The headquarters of the Trim Partisan Detachment borrowed 10,000 livres from Jonah Panin, which he undertakes to repay as soon as the people's democratic power is established. Our future friend did not believe that he would ever get his money back. He regarded our actions as extortion. While still counting out those colourful banknotes, he was sure that they were leaving his hands forever. That's why he let out a tear. He did not realise that by our signatures on the receipt we represented our party, that its authority, for its honest word, we were ready to perish and yet the old field Philon hid the receipt. When we left Painin, the three of us, Dencho, Delcho and I, went to Aunt Bozana's house. We told her how everything had happened at the neighbours, and she said, Sigh, now I have peace of mind. In the morning, having hardly waited until dawn, Aunt Bojana, finding a suitable excuse, went to the Panin's house. When she saw that the master was washing his face at the door of the house, she leaned over the fence and shout, Good morning, yo. God bless you, Bazana. The man replied courteously. What was going on at your place last night? Your dogs roused the whole village. Did partisans come by or who attacked you? Aunt Bojana asked not without teasing. Well, they came, and you have a itch. Panin cut her off in the field Pibelian manner. I don't, but the whole village says you gave them a lot of money. A hundred thousand, they say. Panin went to the fence, looked around to see if anyone could hear, and hissed angrily. Thre Not a hundred, but ten gave them, and you keep your mouth shut, because as soon as I tell them that you are against them, so you'll be in trouble. Don't scare me. Aunt Bojan answered him proudly. I sent them to you myself. I was sick of your hints and threats. Now you and I are both bound by the same rope. Oh, what a viper you are. So it was you who sent them to me. Yo gritted his teeth and, shaking his head threateningly, walked away from the fence. After his own confession that he had given the partisans the money, Aunt Bojana was even more amused. Now I have him in my hands, she said to herself and walked away.
This incident not only tamed Panin, but also made the rest of the villagers hold their tongues and generally be more restrained in their actions. It is an early July morning. There is fine dew all around. Almost all of Jarlov's field had already been mowed. The hay had long ago been gathered into bales, and now it was the height of the harvest. Only Lena's meadow has withered and yellowed. Sando had just returned from a long business trip, and Vlado had been mobilized. Although the sun had not yet risen, people were already moving about, hurrying to harvest the wonderfully successful crop. A few puffs of clouds in the sky heralded a light breeze, so welcome in the heat of the sun. At the same time, a motorcycle with a sidecar was speeding along the highway behind the village. Bouncing on stones falling into potholes, it raised a cloud of dust that spread over the fields and mown meadows. Whose mother will they make cry today? Granda Bona asked her neighbour when she saw the police caps of the newcomers. They are going to the upper edge. Either Avram or Ivan will be taken away. They are spotted in the village, answered the neighbour. Her mother Lena woke up in the early morning. She had a bad dream, as if the police had surrounded her barn from all sides. What if some partisans were hiding there? Sighing, she opened her eyes and saw that she was lying on the bed, that there was no shooting, but she could not calm down for a long time. She was worried that sooner or later Mordecai would report her to the police. And Mother Lena got out of bed and went about her chores. First of all, she had to knead the bread, and then she had to go to the nearby meadow to gather hay. Sando, tired from yesterday's mowing, was still asleep. He would have to finish mowing the meadow and take the dried hay away on the cart. But she was sorry to wake him up. Just when Grandma Lena had sifted the flour, two men with revolvers in their hands burst through the door. What a marvel! exclaimed Grandma Lena and dropped the sieve from her hands. Where is Sando? asked the policeman in civilian clothes without waiting for her answer, pushed the door open with his foot and stopped on the threshold, aiming his gun at the bed where Sando was lying. The policeman in uniform also dashed into Sando's room and yelled. Get up now. You can't sleep after your encounters with the Schumanns, can you? Tearing off the blanket, he grabbed Sando's arm. Hey, people, wait a minute. What do you want with my boy? Grandma Lena intervened. Hey, what we want. We'll tell him afterward, but you stay back. You'll get your turn. The police agent snapped at her. No, look at them. They scare me in my own house. Granny Lena was indignant. The policeman dragged Sando off the bed, handcuffed him and dragged him to the motorcycle. Grandma Lena followed them, secretly wiping away her tears. She asked the policeman to wait a minute and rushed into the pantry, grabbed the last crust of stale rye bread from the kivashniki, took out a circle of hard cheese from the kadush, stuffed it into the bread and quickly ran out into the yard. But there was no one there anymore. A motorcycle accompanied by a gang of barefoot children was speeding down the narrow alley toward the school. Hmm, Uncle Sando, they shouted, take us for a ride on the bike. Sando raised his handcuffed hands. The children understood, looked at the policeman with hatred and stopped. Grandma Lena stood at the gate for a long time, gazing into the thick clouds of dust, but she never saw Sando. Now that the enemies were far away, she gave vent to tears, and after crying she sighed, cursed the inhuman policeman, and went into the house. All day Grandma Lena could not take a crumb in her mouth. Everything fell out of her hands. She wandered from house to Kashara, from Kashara to house, and so killed time. From July 7 to July 12, Sando was kept in a dark, damp cellar cramped as a grave, and also covered with all kinds of junk and filth. A tiny square window, shackled with frequent strong bars, overlooked a wall made of grey-green mouldy stone. The high walls of the cell were covered with slogans, drawings, bloodstains, written with farewell words of death row inmates, lines of poetry, sayings of great thinkers. Prisoners left here traces of their innermost thoughts, dreams, aspirations, sometimes labelled with just a few letters. Cut off from the whole world by four thick walls, people tried with an inexperienced hand to recreate what they lack. A sunny meadow, a pine forest, a swift stream, dear faces, supplementing with imagination what they lacked skill. Mordo Chai had committed a terrible meanness. He told the police everything he knew about Grandma Linus, that we were sheltering in her barn, was confirmed by the boy who herded her cattle. Under the circumstances, Sandu couldn't persist and had to confess.
Thus, the police caught the end of the thread leading to the party organizations of the villages of Radovo, Bluhovica, Sislovstika, Baba, and Krest. A little time passed, and it arrested grandmother Lina and her second son Vlado. Then the police moved on to the neighboring villages. The house was emptied. Our kind grandmother Lina's barn was emptied. The same awaited dozens of other families. One day we heard that Tarkosimov from Radov, Asen Yordanov and brothers Hristo and Rangel Todorov from the village of Glogovica had gone into an illegal situation. This made us very happy. The joy, however, did not last long. Soon we learned that one by one these comrades found them and themselves in the custody of the Okali police. Some of them were captured, while others went into the wolf's mouth. Only Tako Semov was not captured. In our instructions, he had moved to Kustendil to cover his tracks and was supposed. If it turned out that the police were still looking for him, to come to our unit at once. His sudden disappearance put the police in a difficult position, because Tarko had to corroborate the testimony given by a member of the Radovan party organization, and also to shed light on some other connections not yet known to the police. Several days passed. The police searched for Tako, but could not find him anywhere. The Radovan headman took up the search for him as well. He set up his own intelligence service, organized round-the-clock surveillance of Tako's house, and all was in vain. The people on whom the headman relied did not listen to the hundred. They were convinced that Taco had been with the guerrillas for a long time, and they insinuated to their leader that he should give up further search. The headman, however, was stubborn in a not-so-stupid way. He reacted to the most insignificant, seemingly insignificant, signals and omens. One morning a pile of letters was brought to him. He put on his glasses and began to slowly read the illiterate addresses. Through the cloudy glasses which sat on the very tip of his long nose, he saw the address Rusida Takova, village of Radovo, Trinska Otedi, Radovo, Trinska Okolia. It is the wife of that robber, exclaimed the headman and clutched the letter tightly with trembling fingers as if it were a bar of gold. It's in the upper left corner of the envelope, the headman read, M.T. Say R. 12 Risto Botev Street, Kyustendil. What a conspiracy! Even jumped with joy and tapped his forehead with the palm of his hand like a student who had suddenly found the right solution to a difficult problem. We've got our bird. He ordered his wife to quickly saddle his horse. She immediately rushed to fulfill the order of her strict husband. In a few minutes, the saddled horse stood at the gate waiting impatiently. All the way to the town, the headman galloped. He did not even notice that he had almost overtaken the horse. He stopped only at the square near the tavern, tied his horse to an old acacia tree, knocked over a bottle of plum wine and went to the Okelian chief's house. He opened the door without knocking, and with the look of a famous detective went to the bearded Dragulov. Here he is, Mr. Chief. Here he is, the brigand, said the headman and handed him the letter. This fellow is living quietly, and I, unfortunate man, haven't slept for so many nights. Looking at the headman with a grin, Dragulov took the letter, wrote the address on a piece of paper, and handed it back. Then he said, with the air of a man giving a generous reward. Thank you, Mr. Starosta. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Hmm. He shook his hand with his chubby hands on which gold rings glittered. Give the letter to his wife and not a word to anyone. Otherwise, I will not vouch for your head. If they find out, they'll kill you. Satisfied with the wise words of his superiors, the headman returned to the village and two days later to Kako, with his hands tied, went down the stinking stairs to the basement of the Trine police headquarters, and for a long time could not understand who had betrayed him. At the beginning of August, it was a difficult time in Trine. Not a day went by without the police arresting several people. Slavcho Nikolov was sent to the Enikioi camp. His brother Jordan was next in line. This was evident from the arrests that had already taken place, and members of the Okoli party leadership, Stoyan Yakimov and Arso Rashev, felt it necessary to warn him. Yekimov went to see Jordan. He was an Okoli agronomist, and his service enabled him to leave the city at any time. He distributed seed potatoes or some other planting material or something else to the population. Yakimov immediately upon his arrival in Shipkovitz, met with Jordan and told him with great anxiety and concern about the events in the town and the Okolia and what might happen if Jordan did not immediately move to an illegal position. Jordan expressed regret that he had no connection with the partisans, cursed the hated fascist authorities, gave Yakimov directives about the work to be done in the Okolia, 
and in the midst of all this forgot, only to inform him whether he was going to become a partisan or not. In farewell, Jordan shook hands with the agronomist, patronizingly said a few encouraging words, in which sounded the confidence in victory, and saw him off with a long look. Left alone, he calmly weighed all the circumstances. The decisive moment had come when the party demanded of him, a communist who had for years educated the party cadres in Okoli in the spirit of selflessness, that he himself should give himself entirely to the struggle. But he had no guarantee that he would preserve his life in the struggle, and Jordan hesitated. The following event decided the way out. On the morning of August 6, a small, frail, yellow with fear, policeman appeared before Nikolov. Next to the tall-shouldered Jordan, he looked like a dwarf. The short carbine he held in his hand gave him courage only to speak. Mr. Nikolov. Mr. Bailiff asks you to come to him for an urgent inquiry. Here is the summons, and the policeman held out a piece of paper with a trembling hand. Jordan read the summons carefully, understood what was written in it between the lines, carelessly pulled his cap on his head, took his cloak, and him sing little Jagana with the look of a man who voluntarily sacrifices himself for his loved ones, turned to his wife and said, Goodbye, Nikolichka. If I am delayed, don't be alarmed. Perhaps it will be better that way. It was six kilometers to the village of Liva Rika, where the police station was located. This distance Jordan and the little policeman traveled in an hour or so. When the policeman saw Jordan at the police station, they were confused. They had no idea that he would fall for their bait. But since the experience had been successful, the bailiff decided that Jordan could be sent with the same policeman straight to Tryon. On the road, which passed through a dense forest, Jordan and the policeman stopped more than once. The policeman even dozed off, so that it was quite a suitable situation for escape. But our communist did not dare to do so. He counted on the mercy of Dragulov and Baikushiv, the worst enemies of the partisan movement in Trenska Okolya. Others also hoped for their mercy. Thus, because effective measures were not taken in time to go underground, 32 party members fell into the hands of the police. Instead of 32 new partisans in our unit, 32 new political prisoners sat in the police. But from fighters they were turned into prisoners. The Okoli party organization received a serious blow. Great new difficulties were created for the activities of the party and the squad. We lost such faithful helpers as Grandmother Lina from Jalovsi, Asen Yordanov from Hlohovica, Angel Stojanov from Mislovstitsa, Bainidelko from the village of Baba. Almost our entire channel to Bresnik was uncovered. We were seriously angry then with all these comrades, except Grandma Lina. It could not be said that they had no opportunity to hide at least temporarily or to establish communication with the detachment. At the slightest wish on their part, they could have become partisans. The detachment wanted very much to replenish its composition with local people who knew the local conditions well. We all wanted and were able to inflict bold blows on the enemy, but it didn't happen. It did not happen for the simple reason that the comrades were either not convinced of the correctness of the party line, or they thought that they would be safer in the hands of the police than fighting in a partisan detachment. To the intensification of police terror, we responded with even greater activity. Every night we carried out one and sometimes two actions. This required from the fighters great firmness, both physical and moral, and tempered the partial will and endurance. Even the weakest of our girls, like Bonka and Violeta, and those already made 30-kilometer night crossings and overcame long distances without rest. And at the same time, we did not stop classes on combat and political training, studied weapons and their practical application, learned the instructions of the zone command, which gave instructions on the life and activities of partisan units, regularly read and discuss party documents covering the latest developments. During these discussions, fighters and commanders deeply penetrated into the decisions of the party, asked questions, spoke out. As a result, they better understood the goals of the struggle, even more firmly bound themselves to it, ready for any trials because they clearly realized that they were going to these trials for the good of their people. The partisans were most concerned about the sincerity of the attitude of England and the United States to the Soviet Union. Many comrades doubted the honesty of the Western Allies, suggested that they will still try to deceive the Soviet Union. This, they say, will happen towards the end of the war, when England and the United States, believing that the Soviet Union is exhausted, will attack it and defeat it. That is why they are saving their forces, 
comrades explained a number of events, and especially the delay with the opening of the Second Front in Europe by these plans of the USRIs. We explained to the soldiers that for the Soviet Union the intentions of the capitalists are obviously not a secret, but it cannot refuse from treaties and alliances which favour its strengthening and contribute to winning the sympathy of the peoples of the capitalist countries to who see in the face of the USSR a genuine fighter for peace. The capitalists of all countries equally hate communism. They are its bitter enemies. But there are contradictions between them, which sometimes force them to seek cooperation with the Soviet state. The Soviet government readily accepts this, because the basis of Soviet foreign policy is the desire to live in peace and understanding with all peoples and states, regardless of their social order. The political talks encouraged the fighters and enriched them with new arguments concerning international and domestic political developments, which were much needed for agitation among the peasants. In some villages located high in the mountains, we ventured to appear even in the afternoon, or rather in the morning, when people had not yet gone to work. The first time we did this was in Kaishle, one of the smallest villages in Okolia, near the Bulgarian-Yugoslav border. Before showing up in the centre of the village, we stopped by the brothers Arso and Gencho's house. They lived a little out of the way, and it was very convenient to get to their house. I knew Arso and Gencho. Back in the day, they were good people, honest and hard-working. Arso was a carpenter, made excellent sturdy chairs, beehives, pitchforks, rakes and the like. He was a friend of my father's, and there were chairs in our house made by his skilful hands. When I met the two brothers, I tried to find out their attitude to the policy of our party and finally became convinced that they were like-minded. Now, discussing the purpose of our visit to Kaishil village, we set ourselves the task of contacting Arso and Gencho and assigning them a certain task. Both brothers were overjoyed when fit young partisans and partisan women filled their courtyard. They familiarised us with the situation in the village and pointed out to us the people who had weapons. After sunrise, the detachment went down a steep winding path to the part of the village where the headman lived and stayed about an hour. The headman made arrangements for food, and the partisans made explanatory work among the peasants. About noon, the detachment entered the forest near the frontier line. In the afternoon, moving through the forest, we came across a woodcutter. It was Sava Petkov, also from Kaisley. His house lurked in the depths of the forest and such houses, and even with kind people, were just right for us. In the evening, when the detachment was on its way to the church forest, south of the village of Upper Melna, Densho and I went again to Arso and Gencho to find out from them what kind of a man Sava Petkov was. So that day we increased our network of trusted people by two more families, Arso and Gencho's brothers and Sava's by. We spent the night in a clearing overgrown with ferns and surrounded by a beech forest. The peasants of Kaishlev had provided us with food, and the headman had also done his best. Let him serve. We allow it, some of our comrades joked. In the morning we all washed up at a fast cold stream in a nearby valley, had breakfast and went about our daily business. Military training and political enlightenment. And where is Peter? Suddenly sounded someone's anxious question. Indeed, Peter Shukov was not there. We searched the fern bushes, maybe he fell asleep somewhere, or maybe he felt bad, but we didn't find him. We looked for him at the spring, deafened the whole forest with our signals, but there was no Shkutov. Everyone was alarmed. Shitov was the youngest of our partisans. At one time he was a member of the Chevdar detachment, then broke away from it, returned to Sofia and from there was sent to us. Judging by his mood, no one could have supposed that the boy could have decided to desert. But this was soon confirmed by serious evidence. In Velko's holster, instead of a pistol, was a stone of the same approximate weight as the gun. Not far from the clearing, we found a stockpile of underwear. He stole the gun from Velko and threw away the underwear to keep them out of the way. Everything confirmed that Shukovov had deserted. We were obliged to take precautions and moved the camp the same day. At the meeting of the detachment considered Shitov's deed. By this time there was a need for some reorganization of the detachment leadership. The fact is that Delcho often had to be absent, and then all the responsibility for the combat activity of the detachment was placed on one Dencho. Therefore Delco and I needed to have deputies to direct the work in our absence. Stefan and Dencho were more suitable for this role. Stefan was appointed deputy commander and Dencho deputy commissioner. Both of them were experienced, 
politically mature people and enjoyed authority among the soldiers of the detachment and the population. Therefore, our proposal was approved by the whole detachment. In addition, the fighters were to take the guerrilla oath. They had long waited for this solemn moment, but first, it was necessary to conduct explanatory work on the meaning and significance of the oath and the duties arising from it. The oath in the life of partisans is a great and important event. It obliged them to show selflessness, firmly and patiently bear all the difficulties, never pass up in front of them, to be honest, to fight for the freedom and independence of the people and severely punish their enemies. Whoever violates the oath will be subjected to the strictest punishment. Now, after Shkutov's escape, it was decided to take the oath the same day. A sepulchral silence stood in the forest. Everything stood still, not even the leaves on the trees, whose branches closed over the small clearing in a green vault. The soldiers, lined up in two rows, anxiously waited for the solemn moment, and here it came. I read phrase by phrase, and the soldiers and commanders softly repeated in chorus. With pride and joy, I accept the title of participant in the People's Liberation Guerrilla Movement. In the face of my comrades, in the face of all the people, in the memory of the heroically killed fighters of the Patriotic Front, I swear that I will give all my strength and life to the liberation of my homeland and the whole world from Hitler's tyrants, invaders and their Bulgarian servants, from fascist tyranny. I swear to fight with arms in my hands for the implementation of the program of the Fatherland Front. I swear to carry out the combat orders of my commanders, not to give away secrets that can be used by the enemy, and may severe punishment and shame fall on me if I betray this oath. Long live the Fatherland Front. Long live the People's Liberation Partisan Army. Death to fascism. Freedom to the people. The comrades swore an oath. Having taken the oath, it was as if they had passed through purgatory. Suddenly everyone felt better, and at the same time in each increased sense of responsibility, they were now soldiers of a new army, the army of the people. From that moment they seemed to become more cheerful and confident in victory, more courageous and stronger, ready to rush fearlessly into battle. All day in the camp there was only talk about the partisan oath. In the evening we went to see Stratigigov, a blacksmith from the village of Upper Melna. He had two sons, Milko and Basil. Basil was my gymnasium classmate. At that time he was a member of the RMs. Later he went to Sofia, went to university, graduated from the reserve officer's school and remained in military service until the end of the war. His father had a blacksmith shop, a two-story house and a decent amount of land. Not only did he have the appearance of a rich corbadje, he was also so by his property status. This old democrat was very similar to the chief of the Trin police, Baikushev, with whom he had common views on many things, for which they respected each other. Stratigigov knew how to speak sweetly. Sometimes it seemed that honey dripped from his lips, so he was able to portray how much he loved, respected and honoured you. That was how I had known him in my gymnasium years, when I visited Vasil. He was still like that now. As soon as I entered the courtyard, Stratigigov immediately rushed toward me and extended his meaty hand, as if I were his old friend. What an ass! he exclaimed angrily. Why don't you be careful? Look, Kocha will grab you. That's what he called by Kushiv. He will, if you give me away, or else he won't catch me. Chesus Lebo, my boy, how can you even think such a thing? I love you as I love my Vaso. If I hated you, I'd kill at least one of you when you come to see me. No, no, I'm not that kind of person. Without waiting for my question, Strati Gigov himself informed me that he had a gun. But I let it pass and decided to confiscate the gun later. Now I only inquired about the movements of the police, the trails and villages we were interested in and lift. From my conversation with Strati Tititov, I realized that Shkutov had already been caught by the authorities. There could be no other way for deserters. We had to prepare for new trials. Shkutov, like Mordecai, could cause us a lot of trouble, but in spite of everything, the leadership of the detachment began to prepare for the next operation. We were to set fire to the Vukan communal administration. The village of Vukan lay on the highway between Kostarinci and Trinand was heavily guarded by a contrachita. However, we expected that after our appearance in Kaishli, the police would rush to that area and relax the guards elsewhere. As the distance to the Vukan community was more than could be covered in one crossing, the party camped near the bend in the road to Upper Menis, not far from where the Bay of Trico once been lost. 
All day long we had the opportunity to watch the movement of the police. They were travelling in trucks towards Kaishla. Everything was going as we had expected. The enemy was denuding one area in order to pursue us in another. In order not to lose time, as soon as dusk fell, we went down the valley of the river. In two hours we were already near the Vukan community. We organised a reconnaissance. Information from all sides confirmed that the object was not guarded. The fighters acted with lightning speed. Some smashed safes, aves, others packed trophies, others took out documents. In a short time, the entire archive was piled on the road in front of the community office. There were all the registers, tax books, requisition orders, fine receipts, political characterizations and residents of the community. We poured kerosene on this huge pile and set it on fire, and when the flames engulfed it on all sides, we retired to a pine forest north of the village of Zabel. Before the police arrived, the archive would be burned to the ground and the population would be freed from various taxes, fines and levies for many thousands of livres. This is how the Vukan community was put out of business, and its headman, the communist Alexei Apostolov, was left without a place. The tax collector of this community, expecting an attack, took the money from the safe every evening and carried it away with him, expecting that if the partisans came upon the community, he would accuse them of theft, and he himself would get rich from it. That evening the collector took the money as usual. The next day he came to the Okolian chief and reported that we had taken 150,000 livres from the community treasury. When we learned of this treachery, we sent him a letter in which we obliged him to return the money to the community immediately, otherwise he would be punished in the strictest manner for slandering the partisans. At the same time we also informed the whole community. Two days later, the collector handed over all the money to the community. After this action the detachment stayed for two days near Mount Rui. Our aim was to take shelter for a while and cover our tracks, as well as to gather information about the number of police garrisoned in the village of Kalna, northwest of the mountain. We were out of bread, but we expected to hold out on a small quantity of green beans, which we had gathered while passing through Znipol, and also on those sheep which were grazing on the slopes of Mount Rui, so we had no danger of starvation as yet. On the morning of the next day a light mist fell over the mountains. This allowed us to build a fire. We broke the bean pods, unpacked the manekas, filled them with beans and water and buried them in the hot ashes of the fire. We had no salt. We were to try whether it was possible to eat unsalted beans. Soon everyone was convinced that this brew was not worth much. Only spoiled manerki, complained the partisans. However, no one had any beans left. By noon the fog cleared. Long-awaited sheep appeared near the camp. Did these sheep wander in here by chance? Without addressing anyone in particular, Stefan asked, puzzled. Besamut must be determined. That's up to you, someone answered him. But anyway, we can say that they come in handy. Without waiting for my instructions, Stefan started down the slope where the sheep had come from. Sip up. I called him quietly, and he turned around. Have you got any money? I have. Mo. No. How much? Over a thousand. Yes. Then take Ojern with you and buy a lamb. Let a Gonshan stay with the shepherd and you bring the lamb. Yes, sir. Stefan answered in a military manner, and he and Ongjan walked up the slope ten metres apart. The fifth lock, as it turned out, belonged to several owners. The shepherd, seeing the armed men, was so frightened that he offered a lamb for free. Choose whichever one you like best, he said. I'll tell the owner that I've lost it. Did the wolves eat it? Stefan joked. And two-legged, Ogjan added jokingly. The shepherd looked at them. He liked the joke, and became bolder. Now in the mountains, he said, four-legged and two-legged wolves roam. We do not want gifts. As much as it costs, we will pay, said Stephen. The shepherd was reluctant. At first he refused to give Dean eggs at all, and then he gave a price four or five times less than it was worth. Stefan, seeing that the boy was afraid not to take more from us than he should, counted out eight hundred livres to him. Take this money and give it to the owner of the lamb in five days. Until then, say nothing. If you don't fulfil our order, our friendship is over. The shepherd took the money, thanked us, and promised to do everything as we demanded. Shais Tarsov took care of the lamb. He was an experienced butcher, and Agdian prepared the spit. It seemed to everyone that we were taking too long with the meat. 
Our patience finally broke just when the lamb was perfectly roasted, and we began to feel so hungry that even if we had salt and could have eaten properly, we would not have done any better. There was nothing left of the lamb. According to intelligence, the police garrison in the village of Kalna amounted to about a company. Food was delivered there every Tuesday and Saturday on horseback from Glavarnovs, which was six or seven kilometers from Kalna. It was usually taken through the area of Barno, a wide strip of bare shale rock along the borderline, framed on three sides by a stunted beech forest. Early Saturday morning, our boys took up a comfortable position near the eastern edge of Barpos and began to watch for police movement. With the naked eye, we saw four riders in blue uniforms, led by an officer, cross the border furrow and begin to descend towards the village of Ranilug. The officer was armed with an automatic rifle and the policeman with carbines. It was more profitable for us to fire on them not now, but when they were returning, then we would get white bread, vegetables and cigarettes for the smokers. We decided therefore to be patient. The police had to experience firsthand what it was like to take away dowries from girls to beat innocent peasants, to burn down the houses of partisans. We and the peasants had already accumulated enough anger to settle accounts with them, and we were prepared to wait in ambush for a convenient opportunity for five or six days. Our aim was to smoke the policemen out of Kalna. They were a nuisance to us and to the population. The place we had chosen for the ambush had its positive and negative sides. The worst of all was that the little hollow along the edge of which the path ran was overgrown with thick bushes, so that if any of the policemen were alive and decided to flee, they could easily hide in it. But no matter how hard we tried to avoid this inconvenience, no matter how we searched for a better position, we found nothing better, and were forced to remain in the place we had originally chosen. We were not very experienced in ambushes. We felt that we would make many mistakes, but we were sure that the next ambushes would be better. The men took their places and were allowed to rest until a certain time. Whoever wanted to sleep, let him sleep, but at the agreed signal given by the sentry, everyone had to prepare for battle and keep an eye on their target. The few hours of waiting did not pass quickly. The fact that this ambush was the first, that the police group might be resisted, that after the operation there would be a long forced march, all this worried the comrades and kept them not only awake, but also silent. They wanted, despite the distance separating them, to share their thoughts and feelings, but it was strictly forbidden. The success of the operation depended above all on keeping it in the strictest secrecy and on the complete surprise of the attack. And the frightened policemen were very cautious. They looked behind every rock, behind every bush. With such ultra-cautiousness, even the most insignificant rustle or sound might have led to utter failure. About five o'clock in the afternoon, we heard the agreed signal. An electric current ran through the body of each fighter. Immediately we saw... At a great distance from each other, four mounted policemen coming over the crest of the mountain. The chief was not with them. Stand by, ran from left to right. Yes, stand by, was answered in the opposite direction. Murtafi, sire, came my excited voice, and at the same second fourteen men fired a volley. Oh, fire, I repeated the command, and the next shots each man fired at his own discretion. Said the first volley, one of the policemen fell. He tried to crawl away into a nearby shrubbery, but did not have time. He remained lying by the path. The other one fell too, and he must have been badly wounded. The last two policemen left their horses and ran into the woods. Our fire was not accurate. It could not have been accurate, because two-thirds of our men had no military training, and a good shot can only be made by systematic training, but we just didn't have enough ammunition for that. We got some excellent trophies. First of all, fresh white bread, vegetables, cigarettes, postal parcels, and in general, all the police mail. Now the detachment was provided with food for several days. On the same day, the police company had to leave the village of Kalna. It was quartered in the school building of Hlavanipsi village. In a few days, the police turned the schoolyard and the orchard, the property of the school, into a powerful fortified post with bunkers, machine gun nests, communication lines, and barbed wire. Obviously, they were preparing to stay here for an extended period of time. The inhabitants of Kalna, who were in the area where the Yugoslav partisans were operating, were eternally grateful to us for forcing the police to leave their village. After all, under it the peasants lived like savages. They were not allowed to gather in the evening in the square, to light lamps in their houses. 
As soon as a light came on in a window, they would shoot at it. During the day, the policemen would go around the village and grab whatever they could get their hands on. Some chickens, some sheep, some piglets, some calves. They robbed during the day and feasted at night. The peasants groaned at them, but there was no one to complain. Partisans were their only defenders. On the second day, a group of policemen came to Kalna. They came to take out their anger on 12-year-old Branko and his father, who were accused of having links with the Tryon detachment. That day, a peasant from the neighbouring village of Hradsko in Kalna, with his son Branko, went to Havanovsi on business. They passed by our ambush shortly before the police drove by. Now the police presented the whole case in such a way that they, they said, were connected with us and accused the father and the boy of betrayal. They were arrested and taken to Kalna. Police Chief Dikov was in charge of the investigation. He interrogated them publicly in front of the school building, with all the inhabitants present. Realising, however, that his cruelty only served to disgust the assembled peasants, Dikov drove the arrested men into one of the schoolrooms and continued the interrogation there. Were you in Glavenopsi on the day of the attack? Dikov asked the arrested men. We were, answered the father. Why did you go there? I seemed to shopping. Necessity. Did our policemen offer you to go with them? They did. Why did you go ahead of them? To warn the guerrillas, to tell them the cops were following you? That's why, you bastards. Hmm. And Dikov started beating father and son with a stick. Tell me, which of the partisans are you meeting? He attacked the father again. We haven't met with anyone, Mr. Chief. We have not seen any partisans in our eyes, replied the peasant, holding his hand on the shoulder on which Dikov had struck him particularly hard. The boy was silent and looked at his father from time to time. He was afraid for his father, not for himself. Speak. The police chief yelled at him now. When the wounded policeman caught up with you, why did you not give him a horse, but made him walk? Tell me why. Again he began to beat the boy's back with his baton until it broke. Franco remained silent. What could he say? He didn't give the policeman a horse because he hates the police. Didn't they burn down their hayloft? Answer me, chump. Silent as a chump, that's all. Speak up or I'll shoot him. Dikov frightened him and ordered one of the policemen to take a rifle. Mr. Chief, leave the boy alone. Kill me if you have to, the father begged. We'll kill you and him. Kill all the communists, you hear, you brute, roared the enraged policeman, and with even greater fierceness he beat the unfortunate father with a rubber truncheon. The father could not stand it and fell to the floor but the rubber truncheon continued to whip his skinny shoulders. When Branko saw the rifle in the policeman's hands, he thought that it was the end, gathered all his strength and ran away through the open window. A jump from a low height gave him a chance to make a quick escape down the slope. But the policeman, wasting no time, squatted down, took aim and fired. Branko, with his last strength, ran just at that time to the corn yellowed from the drought, but a bullet caught up with him and hit him dead. He fell to the ground, blood dripping from his left ear and drying on his whitened cheek. The furious policeman placed guards around the boy's body and did not allow anyone to approach him. Branko lay in the sun for two days and only when the policeman left Kalna, hundreds of peasants gathered around the body of the young patriot, Branko's burial took place in his native village. As the coffin with the body was being lowered into the ground, a group of Krenotrava partisans fired a rifle volley. On the white stone placed on Branko's grave, even now the words of the partisan greeting burn. Death to fascism. Before the operation in Barnas, we had not been to Kalna and did not know the people there. But after Branko's murder, their hatred of the Bulgarian police grew even more intense. And we made such friends with the peasants that the whole village was one of our best bases until the end of our struggle. When we returned to Rui, we made a thorough review of our actions and learned a serious less. The attention of all must be directed to firearms training. To this we set about doing just that. During the three-day rest, the squad leaders went through all the police mail. There were letters from Rusenska, Razgrad, Schumann, Popov and other regions of the country. Their wives and children wrote to the police officers. They wrote that life had become unbearable, that it was impossible to pay the taxes imposed on them by the community that the requisitions hung heavy on their necks. This gave us reason to enter into written communication with them and to emphasize that the situation in Trianokoli was no different from that in their area, that their relatives, dressed in police uniforms, were preventing the situation from improving. 
that they were not defending the interests of the people, but of foreign and their own Bulgarian fascists. Finally, we suggested that they urge the Ministry of the Interior to return the police officers to their homes as soon as possible. Otherwise, we give no guarantees about their life. These letters, as we expected, made a big difference. All those who received them not only became alarmed, but also made an urgent request to the relevant police department to release their loved ones from police service. This led the police officers to request the Ministry of Interior and the Ministry to request the Oakley Police Department in Tryon, demanding an explanation from its chief as to how the police mail had fallen into the hands of the partisans. Thus it came to a strict reprimand of the police chief for failing to protect the supplying organs. After this action, the police themselves became more cautious, and those who were demoralized were transferred to other Okoli. Angel Stojanov from the village of Mislovstitsa was also arrested. His father literally could not find a place for himself. All day long he wandered the village streets, looking for some kind person with whom he could share his grief, and when he came home he felt like a dead. The old man was not so much worried that he himself might be arrested and sent to some unknown land. He was more concerned that he had three souls left in his care, that he would no longer be able to help the partisans, that they would no longer be able to come to him. These thoughts gave him no rest, chasing him from place to place. The second son of Stoyan's grandfather, Veljo, worked in Pernik as a miner. When he learned of his brother's arrest, he left the mine with the permission of the party leadership to join a partisan unit. Veljo believed that he had a duty to take his brother's place in the struggle, regardless of the possible consequences. He reached the village at night. Grandfather Stoyan was surprised to see him at such a time, usual only for partisans, and was very worried that he too might not be caught by the police. Why have you come, Velo? It's not enough that they took Angel away. Now I have to be afraid for you too. Maybe I won't fall into their hands like a brother. I'm joining the guerrillas, and if you know any channel, I beg you, Father, don't upset me, help me. I Grandfather Stoyan lowered his head and, dropping a tear, stroked Veljo's head. It was all the old man's father could do at that moment. Veljo looked at his grey in hair and felt sorry for the old man. It was getting evening. The woods near Miss Lovstitsa became noisy. One by one the partisans came out of it in columns. The fighters were in a cheerful mood. Recently they had acted successfully and decisively. The meeting in the village of Kostra Shopsi, the appearance of the partisans in broad daylight in Kaisley, the burning of the Vukan communal office, the ambush against the police in Barnos and the meeting last night in the village of Zabel. All this gave them new strength for the struggle. Stefan lined up the fighters, checked their weapons, assigned patrolmen and guards to the village, and led the column. When it passed the gate of Grandfather Stoyan, Dencho and I went to see the old man. It is difficult to describe the joy with which he and his son greeted us. Grandfather Stoyan could not hide his excitement. Not ashamed of his age, he cried like a child. Home, the bastards took my angel Slavcho. I was left alone like a cuckoo, he said through his weeping and put his hands on my shoulders. When I began to explain to him that the fight against the enemy was cruel, that it would cost us many more victims, Grandfather Stoyan stopped crying. I know it's all true, my dear, but it hurts so much. Now Velo wants to leave me. He's decided to go with you. Will you let him go? You young people understand more about these things than we do. Do what your mind tells you to do. Grandfather Stoyan wiped his eyes, took his staff and went with us to the square, where many people had already gathered. The conversation with people started casually. We did not make reports on the international and internal situation. All events were stated and explained in conversations with peasants or in a dispute with some adherent of the authorities. On the stairs in front of the headman's office stood Bonka. She fervently urged the girls and boys to follow the example of the partisans. But then there was some excitement among those gathered. It turned out that Vionator and Petko had captured a policeman from the Zlata mine, disarmed him and brought him here. Seeing this, Vailho took a few steps forward and said loudly, Nuchevin comrade Slavko, permit me to take the policeman's weapon and join the ranks of your brave fighters. I want to take the place of my arrested brother. I thanked Vejo for his determination and kissed him. A horror rang out across the square. Petko handed Vejo his rifle and pistol, and the girls belted out a partisan song. When the song was over, Vejo climbed the stairs and shouted at the top of his voice, Um, 
Comrades, dear fellow villagers, the hour of reckoning with fascism has come for me. This evening I take the pledge to serve with arms in the hands of our Equal Workers' Party and to fulfil my party duty to the end. I swear to you and to all our people that I will not spare my life for the freedom and happiness of ours. The Working Class Having pronounced the oath, Vejo kissed his weapon, hugged his father and sister goodbye, and took his place in the guerrilla column. The fighters belted out a song, and the peasants clapped to the beat and shout. Nurge, guys come more often. We are calmer and more cheerful with you. Many of the partisans did not hear the invitation. They had already distanced themselves and were walking, carried away by the cheerful words of the song, through valleys and over hills. The division marched forward to take Primorye, the White Army's stronghold. One by one, the peasants went to their homes. Grandfather Stoyan stayed alone in the square and listened to the partisan song until it was completely silent. Returning home, he sighed and said, It is better to die a fighter than to rot alive in a fascist prison. Semipopsi were only five kilometers away from Mislovshitsa. This village had its own communal administration and police station, but we did not have a person there to give us the information we needed. Previously, there had been a large and active party organization. Most of its members worked as miners in Pernik, where they had been attracted to the party by Dimitrov and Timoko Nenkov. Year after year, they grew under its wing, spreading the communist truth. In 1923, many of them performed work that involved risking their lives. At that time, after the defeat of the September uprising, it was necessary to create an underground channel for the transfer to Yugoslavia of old revolutionaries who were threatened with imminent death. Now these people were not in the village. Some had died, others had been expelled, others had emigrated. There was no party organization. But the revolutionary traditions were carried on by the youth, young men and women, many of whom now lived in Sofia. I kept in touch with some of them, and they, for their part, visited the village from time to time to bring the true words of the party to their fellow countrymen, and kept up the spirits of many people who had formerly sympathized with our struggle, but now had become despondent, frightened by the terror. The police station and the communal administration tempted us very much. This temptation was strengthened by the fact that Vejohu had scouted the security of the community and the number of policemen during the day, and there was no particular obstacle to our attack that very evening. Besides, the police had lost our trail, and we had time enough to move on to another neighborhood. It was done. While still on the road, we devised a plan. One group would act against the community and the other against the police station. The first group consisted of three people. The second group had all the others. We approached the village without anyone noticing. No one guessed our presence even as we took up our initial positions for the attack. The gardens and orchards provided us with excellent cover. Since the community's archive was located on the second floor of a private house, and we did not have time to take it out on the road, we burned it on the spot and warned those living in the lower floor to leave. When I informed the owner of the house, his little daughter pointing to the window, asked, Hmm, uncle, you don't set fire to houses, do you? Never, girl, but this time we don't have time to pull out the archives. The state will build you a new house. Soon the archive was engulfed in flames, and we left to help the second group acting against the police. The site was housed in a light structure. There was no fence in front of the house, and the entrance was directly from the street. But the sides of the house were enclosed by a high stone wall, which was not easy to jump over. The position of the policemen was favourable. They had prepared positions in the attic in advance, convenient for repelling an attack, and from there they were firing their automatic rifles at the whole street and the opposite houses where our people lived. Simka Durova, the mother of several children, most of whom were members of the RMs, went to the window from the very beginning of the shooting and watched what was happening. She was worried about her husband, a conscientious man whom the headman had appointed to the village guard, since he had to work the next day. He asked a fellow villager to switch shifts with him, he for the first shift and the other for the second. And so they did, but it was not good for the glorious grandfather Juro. He and I were old pals. We were introduced by his daughter Stanka in January of the 40s during the elections to the People's Assembly. Juro himself was not very literate, but thanks to the influence of his son Stoyand and his daughter Stanka, the same girl who was a member of the underground leadership of the construction workers in Sofia, 
He was well versed in the politics of our party and always supported it. Stoyan had already been in prison for several months for communist activities. This embittered the old man even more against the fascists and tied him more closely to the Communist Party. Simka Jirova did not stand at the window for long. The bullets quickly forced her to hide. She crawled to the lid that covered the entrance to the cellar, carefully lifted it and climbed down the ladder to safety without being able to warn her husband to be careful. The bullets continued to clatter on the stones lying in the street, whistling through the windows and into the walls of the houses. At this time, Grandfather Guro was looking for the partisans to give them his rifle, to show them how to get to the station and capture the policemen. But as he wandered in the darkness amid the smoke and dust, some stray bullet, apparently ricocheting, wounded him in the stomach, and he fell. Trying not to moan, he called one of our comrades, gave him his rifle and ammunition, without even giving his name, and remained lying severely wounded near the steps of the cooperative shop. The next day he was taken to the hospital, but due to the lack of attention of the doctors, in which the police intervened, he died two weeks later. The fight dragged on. The police barricaded in the attic and taking other advantageous positions, and in the silence of the night, the gunfire could be heard far away. The disruption of telephone communication with the city, which was only eight kilometers away, could have taught the police there that something had happened in the direction of Philippopsy and forced them to send reinforcements. And we were running out of ammunition. There was no point in continuing the firefight. We had to take out the police nest as quickly as possible. We decided to throw grenades at the station and after destroying it, forced the police to surrender. We threw only two grenades and their machine guns were silenced. We left to Zavalskaya Kupe, a wooded height in the vicinity of the village of Yaroslavsi. The passage from Filipovsi to Zavalskaya Kupe was quite strenuous. When we entered the village of Zavala, the detachment was already on the territory of Breznik Okolia. Until now, we had never managed to destroy the cheese factory in Yaroslavsi, and now we had such an opportunity. In the evening, we went straight down to the cheese factory in Yaroslavsi. There were no guards. The brinza in the tubs had already fermented and seemed to be waiting for our arrival. Just as we were getting down to business, a few peasants came running. No, nah, guys, wait. Don't throw away the brinza. It was left for us. And they said, all right, we won't, we agreed. Since the cheese is yours, we have no reason to destroy it. God bless you. That's what you call reasonable people, said by Isaiah R. Yatak. We finished with the cheese factory, and, accompanied by the peasants, went to the square. Our patrol was already making speeches to the boys and girls. Among them I recognized Stanka and Zora, the daughters of by Isaiah. When they saw me, they separated from the company and came to say hello. We have your raincoat. I'll bring it right away, Stanka whispered in my ear. I was very happy. It was the same raincoat that Delcho had left behind in July during the shootout with the police. Since that day it had been cherished by the Rim sisters, activists in the youth movement, firmly hoping for a reunion. As soon as we entered the village, Delcho went to Sofia. Knowing that we were going to attack the communal administration in the village of Krasava, he informed his comrades in the capital that this operation had already been carried out. However, you were not able to carry it out because the police significantly strengthened the security of the community, and in addition, only four kilometers away from the village in Bresnik, there was a cavalry regiment. That's why we decided to postpone this operation until a more favorable time. But in Yaroslavsi, there was another happy event for us. The detachment increased by two men. Our comrades Toda Maladinov and Kristo Pevanov left this village with us. Encouraged by our successes, the same evening we went to the new village of Goti district. Here we held a meeting to which many residents came, but among them were not my acquaintances who I knew from Sofia. They had not returned to their native village, as we had agreed, and I never met them. Todor Madanov knew the area well, and the Lamas were in no danger of getting lost. He led the detachment into a dense forest where it was not easy to find us. Soon we learned from our friends that the police had taken from the peasants of Yaroslav to save the cheese we had left them. This caused them universal indignation. Now it is clear who are our friends and who are our enemies, said the peasants, when the police loaded the cheese on a truck and left for Bresnik. On August 27, we decided to move to the area of my native village of Bokova. Not far from the village was a large forest, which I knew well from my childhood. 
I knew every ravine, every path, almost every stone. I, Stefan, Velko, Densho, and Lena went first. The others stayed in the same woods. At night we snuck to Aunt Bojana's house. The dog smelled us and raised a bark. We threw three pebbles through the window. Aunt Boshana immediately appeared in it and came out to meet us. She hastily told us all the news she knew and gave us some food. We agreed on what she would have to find out in the afternoon, and then we went to the Boztrekt, where we had our first camp. Here we said goodbye to Denjo and Stefan, who returned to the detachment while Velko, Lena and I stayed in the camp. On our errand, the comrades Juro Simov, Nikola Hristov and Makari Theodosiev brother of my Yatak Basil Theodosier of Bulina Livad Street in Sofia, were to reconnoiter the number of police in the neighbouring villages, and by Tazo, husband of Aunt Boshana, who was to find out what was going on in Trine, and to procure for us hats, pots, combs, mirrors and other things we needed. We had to wait for them. The first three returned, while it was still daylight and informed us that there was nothing to cause alarm. By Tazo was lagging behind for some reason, in the evening, an excited Aunt Bojana came to the camp, out of breath. Slavcho, the village is full of contras. I saw twenty of them myself in the yard of your house. They were picking apples. I'm afraid someone saw you and informed those bastards. You'd better get away from here. I had food ready for you, but I was afraid to take it. And only at the end, as if it were a very insignificant event, Aunt Bojana told us that the king had died. We persuaded our indefatigable assistant that we were not afraid of the Contras and accompanied her to the edge of the forest. When Bojana left, I climbed a tall tree and looked around, but I could neither see nor hear what was happening in the village. Everything sank into darkness and silence. Only the voice of Granny Juna, who was looking for a cow, came from a nearby ravine. Petkana, Petkana here, my daughter come here, was heard from there, a longing call. I climbed down from the tree, and we returned to the detachment. Not far from its camping place we met the sentry, and then the whole column, as agreed. A low ridge rises to the east of Bohova. I used to herd cattle here, and in the summer of 1928, when heavy rains washed away several houses and a lot of cattle, I barely escaped the hail together with a girl, our relative, with whom we herded goats. Now I remembered not only the hail and the downpour, but also the cunning goat Stanika Krevashika, who, ignoring the hail and the muddy streams of water flowing everywhere, ran into the bread, and I had to drive her out of there with a thick stick. I did not notice that we had reached our house. From here to it was no more than two kilometres in a straight line. Suddenly my attention was drawn to the smoke. It rose high into the sky, spread out, and from beneath it crawled first yellowish and then bright red flames. They exploded the darkness and reached for the moon as if they wanted to lick it, and it ran away from them in fear. Our house was burning. So that's what the Contras came for. Our home. How many memories I had of it. Every corner. Every step. Every grain of sand in it and near it were dear to me, connected with many childhood and youthful experiences. It was sad that I would never see again neither the spacious upper room with a three-pane window, nor the crooked step in front of the entrance, nor the wooden bed with a thick layer of straw instead of a mattress, on which we, eight brothers and sisters, tumbled and wrestled, nor the crooked cherry tree, from which I once fell and broke my leg, nor the stone slab, on which I wrote with a slate the first word mother in my life. The house was connected with the memory of my dog Selton, my dear friend. I remembered how I recited at the exam, entering the first grade. I did not come back to you, my father's home, not for joy, not for fun, not taking my eyes off the teacher, afraid to stray. For me then, they were just beautifully chosen words. I understood their meaning only when I had to leave home for the first time. Now the words sounded to me with a new and unfamiliar force. The house burned with a violent flame. Soon it was nothing but ashes. There was an unusual silence. There were no gunshots or screams. The frightened neighbours did not dare to stick their noses out of their houses. The Contras had repeatedly threatened to, to burn the whole village. This fire was the first and no one knew how many of them there would be and whose house would burn after ours. That's why everyone was trembling with fear. One of my comrades suggested that we go down and attack the Contras, but it was unwise to do so without first finding out their numbers and armament. I did not want us to suffer casualties on account of my house. Burnt property could be restored sooner or later, but a man killed in battle could never be brought back to life. There was no point in watching the fire any longer. 
we had to go to Bolshaya Rudina. September 1 was approaching, the day appointed by us for the execution of the sentence of the partisan court, passed on Smilo Jigov and Asen Radoinov for their attack on the commissar of the Delco detachment. The Bratyol tract is unusually beautiful. Our whole family used to live here, spreading walnut trees, island pines, spacious meadows. A man will sit down here and will not want to get up. The nature is so beautiful that he would stay here till the end of his days. It is especially good here after haymaking. Hay is gathered in hay bales, and cattle graze on the mowed meadows. What games we did not start here, hide and seek, shizik, chagut, and sometimes we wrestled, which usually ended in a fight. More than once I came home crying. Those who were older created authority for themselves with their fists. There was a big walnut tree in Bratula. Its nuts were large, soft, and very tasty. Now, understandably, they were not ripe yet, and were not suitable for eating. But the fragrant foliage attracted us, and we sat down under the giant tree's spreading crown. After a short rest dencho, and I went to Juro Semov's Koshara to inquire about the situation in the village and to collect the things bought by Beitazo. Then we were to go to Dencho's native village of Yarlopsi, where one boy who had been released by the police was waiting for us. The rest of us at this time were to continue the march to Bolshaya Rudina. It is on the southwestern outskirts of Jarlovsi lived by Mito. For some reason the peasants called him Mitatu the Frog. He was tall and walked like a bear. We reached the village in the middle of the night and, deciding not to wake Mito, we hid in his crowded shed. The frogman kept here not only straw but also chaff, which reached all the way up to the roof. All the way from Bokovi to Jarlops it rained torrentially. Our clothes and shoes were soaked through. Tired wet we thought only about getting to a dry place as soon as possible, so we immediately burrowed into the chaff. But how could we sleep? The sharps immediately pierced us with thousands of needles. We had to move to the straw and undress, but even here we couldn't sleep. The needles stuck in our underwear, so we had to stay awake for the rest of the night. Early in the morning we heard coughing. Through a long slit in the boarded walls we saw the huge figure of Froggy. As he approached the barn with a clumsy gait, Dencho threw a bundle of straw overhead. It scattered to the sides. Baimito slowly raised his head, looked around, and not thinking that chickens didn't rise so early, shouted, Chu. You wanton. Then he grabbed a handful of sand and threw it on the roof. We had a boyish delight in teasing Froggy. As we were having fun, we threw another bundle of straw at him. We wanted to tease him more. Well, wait a minute, you damned things. I'll take a rod and give you heat. Hmm, threatened Froggy and entered the barn. When we appeared under the roof, he shuddered and then whispered angrily. God bless you, what a fright. Why didn't you answer? and he crawled toward us. Where are you going? Why don't you go to Yarlopsi? Since you killed Mussolini, our village has been quiet. Nobody says anything bad about you. That bandit wanted to kill us. Are you not hungry, or I'll go get something? Without waiting for our answer, he slipped down the straw, ran home, and returned with incredible speed for his temperament, carrying a rich breakfast. Hey, eat it to your heart's content. Your Baimito may not have bread for the children, but he will always have some for you. If the state won't give it, Tasho Letnikovsky will. He's a kind man, he won't leave you hungry. Many people relied on Bartosho when times of hunger came, and he really helped people, some poor people, if it were not for him would have fallen into a completely hopeless situation. Frogger was a devoted man. He did not tremble with fear when we gave him dangerous tasks, and now... As soon as he heard our request to bring to us Dimitar Tokova, the young man who had just been released from arrest by the police, Baimito went to fetch him at once. It was the first time I had seen this fellow. Quite tall, with light brown, almost russet hair, he was calm, reserved. His face was asymmetrical, one cheek slightly larger than the other. His thick voice seemed to come from an empty barrel. We knew from Dencho that Dimitar, or Mito, as he was known in Jarlovsi, was a soldier who had served in the army and was a good shot, and we needed such men, strong, hardy, and most importantly, good shots. Demeter was a rimsist and knew the party directives well. Although he had been released from the penitentiary, he knew that at any moment he could be taken back again, and he in no way wanted to become a prisoner again. Take me with you tonight, Demeter asked us. I don't know what might happen to me tomorrow, you know. It's either a lost cause or a lost one. I'll try to persuade my brother Reiko. 
He just got back from the concentration camp yesterday. How good of you to come. My old men will scream, but it's better to be with you than to fall into enemy hands again. But the old men did not howl, although it was especially hard for them to part with their two sons, whom they had not seen for a long time. One had been under investigation for several months, and the other had been exiled to a distant land. In the evening, Reiko came to the big pear tree in Malabrapishti together with Dimitar. Reiko was younger, shorter, and darker than his brother. Outwardly, he looked like his father, Grandfather Takone, and Dimitar like his mother, Grandmother Bona. Takone's grandfather was a shoemaker and barely earned his bread, but he believed that his children should live differently, and so he used all his energy to make them, since he could not educate them, at least become honest and good people. In this, he succeeded and Baba Bona, with her cheerfulness and good-naturedness, could encourage and cheer up the most desperate person. They accompanied their sons to the guerrilla unit, just when the police were putting gallows for the people's fighters everywhere, putting a huge reward for their capture, mercilessly burning their houses. Taco's grandfather knew that his house would follow ours, but not only did not try to prevent his sons from leaving, but from the bottom of his heart he wished them good luck in their struggle. He was a strong and courageous man. We should have said some consoling words to the old men, thanked them for their conscientiousness, but we could not do it. The joining of Dimitar and Raiko was a new and great success for us. In our joy, we did not notice how we crossed the field and climbed the steep slope of the Slesovs' keels. Suddenly, we met our comrades. They were waiting for us in an abandoned border post above Slesovs' army. The arrival of two new partisan brothers caused them real jubilation. Of course, it was hard to foresee at once what would come out of these guys. If about Dimitra, we knew that he was a good shooter, a daredevil, and a man devoted to our cause. And this gave us reason to see in him a future commander of the four and even of the battalion. We could not say anything about the skinny, small Raiko, nor could we guess his future. But Raiko still made a good impression on me on the first night, which was strengthened in the following days. He was dexterous, clever, easily memorized the paths and people, he was successful in reconnaissance. He slept like a hare and could keep a secret. He also knew how to handle weapons. It was not for nothing that Delcho and Dencho suggested that I take him with me when I left the party. It was risky to go alone. You could always run into an ambush, and in winter you could run into a beast or fall into a snowdrift. In a short time, Raiko and I got to know each other well, got used to each other and got along. Many times when we had to hide somewhere, I made him sleep first. He would refuse, you go to bed, you're more tired. And I'd say, no, you lie down, you're more tired. And so each one gave up the right to sleep first. Later, when the police realized that Dimitar and Raiko had joined the partisans, their house was destroyed by grenades, and the old men themselves were sent somewhere in Dobruja without the right to write letters even to their relatives. But even this did not break Raiko. He was convinced that if not today, then tomorrow the enemy would be forced to return them to their native village. As soon as we returned to the detachment, Densho began to prepare a literary and musical concert. It was supposed to be a recitation of poems by Botivy and Smirensky, excerpts from musical pieces played on the harmonica, partisan songs and humoresque. Our amateur concert ended with the singing of the International. Then everyone spun in a coro. The exuberant pace brought all the dancers to the seventh sweat. Only Zachary, who suffered from sugar disease, stood aside and resented Lena's carelessly belted pants. At the height of the dance, a thunderstorm began. Lightning flashed on the horizon, followed by a deafening rumble. The leaves of the centuries-old beech trees rumbled, the forest shook, and the rain poured down. Stefan, who was leading the coro, suddenly turned to the right and, without breaking tact, led his chain to the abandoned border post. Densho was the last to enter. He was our musician, as there was no room for him in the booth. He threw a holy cloth over his head, and standing under the booth, sang workers' macilles. The others immediately picked up on it, and the appealing, enthusiastic words of the revolutionary song flew out into the open. Rise up, rise up, working people. Rise against the enemy, hungry people. Down the cry of the people's vengeance. Forward, 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 forward. The squad spent the last two days of August at the Slice South Post. Although only the walls and roof remained of it, we were grateful for that, because we could take shelter there from rain or strong wind. We made a fire, and we had beans or potatoes, cooked chowder. 
Information regarding the enemies of the people Smilo Jigov and Aizen Radoinov was collected. Both of them had weapons and slept at home. On the night of September 2, the detachment went down to Slisovsi. We split into two groups. One went to Smilo's house and the other to Radoinov's. But Radoinov was not at home, and the sentence was not carried out. Immediately after the action, a group of fighters separated from the detachment and went to Bokova to find out what were the reactions to Smilo Jigov's execution. On their way back, they again went to Slisovci and visited Georgi Todorov. He was the Primarch in the family of the famous rural moneylender Atanas Vizarov. Although Georgi was considered an advanced man for some reason, the peasants did not believe him. They thought that 99% of what he said was subject to verification. Georgi Todorov seemed to the comrades to be a warm-hearted man. He treated them to honey and a good dinner, and in parting promised to keep their visit a complete secret. This was above all in his own interest, but Georgius changed his mind. Either fearing that the police might somehow find out that the partisans had visited him and punish him for not reporting it, or simply to show himself honest before them, he rose at dawn and went straight to Bakushev's house in Torsh. He told him in great detail about the sudden appearance of the partisans, about their imaginary intimidation, and that he was unable to do anything because they were well armed. The chief of the Trian police, not knowing all the inhabitants of the Okali, did not believe Todorov that the partisans had taken away his food by force and ordered him to be immediately expelled from the village for six months. Returning home, Georgie repented a hundred times for his foolish act, once again tried through intermediaries to influence the chief of police to cancel his decision, but all was in vain Dane. The next day he had to tie his clothes in a knot and again go to the city. Thus, wishing to be honest and conscientious towards the police, Georgi Todorov himself did everything to be sent into exile. In the first days of September, I and Christo Spasov went to Korne Trava. I had an appointment there with Smajevich, while Petko wanted to get to the new border in order to find his younger brother Nidialko, who had served in the Tsarist army, and take him to our detachment. Smajevich was already waiting for me. He and the secretary of the district committee Risto Antunovich were with the brigade that came to the village for rest. I saw Risto Antunovich for the first time. He had an imposing appearance, a calm, concentrated face. We exchanged mutual information. The actions of our detachment had diverted and detained almost all of the Trina police and Contrachets on the territory of the Oka. Now the police rarely raided Yugoslav villages, and the police company from the village of Kalna left that village after our ambush in Barnos. Our actions rendered tangible assistance to the Yugoslav partisans. If it had not been for the Trinsky detachment, all enemy forces would have been thrown into suppressing the partisan movement on Yugoslav territory. Based on our previous agreement, Antunovic agreed to organize a joint attack on the police company in the village of Glavanovsi and to transfer to our territory all the Bulgarian partisans who were fighting in the Yugoslav partisan units operating near our area. They were mostly very young men who had been in military service or mobilized into the army, who, following the directive of the party, deserted from the Tsarist army and joined the partisan detachments. Second after Dencho, Kirill Markov, an acquaintance of mine from Sofia, wished to return to us. He was a member of the brigade with which Smadrik and Antunovic now came to Kiranei Trava. Zlatan was still the same lively and trim guy I knew him to be from his work in the Banisher organization of the RMs in Sofia. When I told him that the Yugoslavs had nothing against his return to us, he burst with joy, and the same day we both went back to Trinska Okolia, and Petko left with the brigade to look for his brother. At Todorovsi we were told that the Trinsky detachment had attacked and defeated the police somewhere. This sounded implausible to me, for I knew what actions we had planned, and I asked my Yugoslav comrades to clarify this apparently random data. Soon we received quite different, completely opposite. In Fermans, not the unit attacked, the police attacked the unit, many comrades were killed and taken prisoner. It was said that only one group of ten men, led by Delcho, had managed to escape and was in the Mahala of Zlatansi near Karna Trava. Having studied the path of its advance, we set out for Kalna. There were none of our people in the village but all the peasants spoke with sadness and anxiety about the misfortune that had befallen us. But however distorted and exaggerated these reports might be, I believed there was some truth in them. I was anxious and anxious to meet at least one of the party. 
At that time, the Yugoslav political workers who had arrived in Kauna organized a general meeting of the villagers. They invited me to it, and I understood it as a necessity to say a few words there. The meeting was not over yet as I felt someone touching my shoulder. I turned around. An unfamiliar Yugoslav whispered to me, Gosho, Comrade Kolo is calling you. I jumped up and, squeezing through the crowd, sprinted out into the street. At the stone fence of the school stood an unhappy Delcho and Zedravko Georgiev. What happened? Tell me. I shouted excitedly and impatiently from afar. We will tell you everything, Delcho answered sadly. He began to tell the story in detail from the beginning. He seemed to me to be dragging on, and I repeatedly urged him on or even interrupted him. This is what happened to them. On the night of September 5, on the western outskirts of the village of Yarlopsi, near Tritko's Koshra, Dencho and Dimitar, were waiting for Delcho, who was to bring some underground fighters from Sofia. After an exchange of signals, a group of eight men approached them. They took them to the tract of Piternitsa, where the detachment settled down to rest. New and old partisans got acquainted, began to ask questions. The newcomers were interested in partisan life, while the old partisans were interested in events at the fronts in Sofia and in their neighborhoods. In the group of newcomers was Zdravko Georgiev, Slavcho Radomirsky, by later Jakova, Metody Bojilov, Marine Dimitrov, and Donka Ganchovska. Bar Pantelej escaped from the barracks and came to the detachment in a soldier's uniform and with weapons. The greatest joy was caused by a small portable radio receiver. It was immediately put into action, and the comrades heard Levitin's voice from Moscow, and in the evening the broadcast of the radio station Histobotev in Bulgarian. Reports of the Red Army's successes at the fronts, and cheerful Soviet music cheered and encouraged the soldiers. In the afternoon, Stanko's grandfather from the village of Leshnikopsi came to the camp. He told Dencho how things were going in their village, and by the way told him that our mutual friend Manol Zakariev, a repairman who worked in Sofia, had been on vacation in the village for several days. When Dencho heard about Manol, he got excited. He is another partisan for us. He asked the old man to arrange a meeting with Manol the same evening. When darkness fell, the detachment withdrew to the neighboring Mahals, Jovisija and Kristina. Mapol Zakariev was to come there as well. The comrades had supper, talked thoroughly with the peasants about everything, but Manol did not come. Hey, it is obvious that Mapol is not going to become a partisan. No, said Delcho. Let's go. We have a long way to go, and the weather is getting bad. We prepared to leave. The detachment was to make a dash to the Regenov Monastery near Janikova Kuki, and then to carry out several actions in Regenovsi, Jinkovsi, and Kostrasov. Just as the detachment set out, a torrential rain poured down. There was no sight of it stopping, and it was risky to stay in the area, so Stefan, Delcho, and Zidravko decided to continue marching despite the bad weather. Several groups separated from the detachment. Dencho and Dimitar went somewhere for organizational matters, and Slavcho Radomirsky and Violeta Jakova, because their legs were completely worn out, and they were unable to make such a long journey, were left in the care of Slavcho Kitkov, who was to take them somewhere nearby to rest. As the man who knew the local places better than the others, and as the deputy commander of the detachment, Stefan led the column. He chose the direction through the Leshnikov fields to the Brayan Spring. In the thickening darkness, Stefan lost his way. Instead of going to the northwest, he led the column to the southwest. Soon the column was not at the Brezhenov Spring, but at the Sigrilov tree. When it became clear that they were going in the wrong direction, Stefan and Delcho decided to get to the Kashara of Gurosemov of Bachova to spend a day there and then continue on to the monastery. So they did so. The guerrillas walked on, paying no attention to the rain, nor to the mud in which they were bogged up to their ankles. They arrived at the Koshara just before dawn, took off their luggage, melted the stove in the room which Baiguro used in winter as a warm sheep fold for the lambs. The next day Aunt Cutter, Baiguro's wife, was the first to come to the Koshara, and later he himself came. They were not embarrassed or frightened by the large number of guests. On the contrary, they immediately got down to business. Aunt Keta immediately went out to instruct the sister to prepare more food, and Bai Juro stood guard. In order not to attract the attention of the peasants who occasionally passed by the barn by his unreasonable standing in the courtyard in this inclement weather, 
he kneaded clay and began to fill up the holes in the wall of the old barn with it. For their part, all the comrades strictly observed the order established by the command. In the evening, several partisans led by Delta went to Aunt Boshana for food, and Stefan and Toda Maldanov went to Grandfather Rangel's sons for the same purpose. Both of them brought food, had dinner in the Koshara, and in the morning they went early to the Rejanov Monastery, but a thick fog descended, and instead of the monastery they found themselves at Janikov Chuki. Seeing an abandoned border post, the partisans thought that it would be a good place to spend a week. And Stefan's instructions, the fighters covered the window and door openings with tent cloths to keep out drafts. Ognian was first on duty, followed by a new partisan, Marin Dimitrov. Marin did not know the area or the partisan rules and stood near the door. In this position he could not observe everything that was going on around him, especially since the fog had not yet cleared. A fire was burning riotously in the room. Most of the comrades, breaking the basic rules of guerrilla life, undressed to dry their clothes. Some even put their rifles aside, forgetting that they might always need them. At the same time, the entire police force was mobilized on Baikushev's orders. He received information from his agents that the abandoned border posts served as hiding places for partisans and ordered all of them to be examined at once. The police company from Halapopopshi was to check the post at Dishan Kladnitz. The platoon from Strezimirovshi was assigned the task of checking the post at Dishan Kladnitz, and the platoons from Klishura and Stajkovci were to check the posts at Janikova, Chuk and Ogorelika. Even after dark, the police began their task. Suddenly Marin noticed several police officers cautiously approaching the post. He flinched, but did not lose his composure. Not comrades police, they shouted. The first enemy volley caught us unprepared. There was a commotion, but a few brief commands from Stefan and Delko quickly restored order. Some jumped out through the door, others through the windows. Occupying the trenches, the guerrillas opened aimed fire and gave the first repulse. The confusion was overcome, but ammunition was too scarce. Each fighter had no more than 10 to 15 rounds. This forced them to strictly conserve their ammunition and to fire only with aimed fire. The onslaught of the policemen was stopped. They lay down near the trench and continued to fire at point-blank range. A faint whisper echoed through the trench on the east side of the post. Stefan is wounded, Stefan is wounded. He had indeed been wounded in the arm. Zadravko immediately covered the wound with a handkerchief, and then Lena crawled up to Stefan with a medical bag and made a bandage. From Stefan's trench, again resounded shots of his obedient manlika. For an hour the guerrillas successfully repelled the attacks, but they were running out of ammunition, Therefore, Stefan decided on an organized withdrawal of the detachment. It's the first to break through the enemy ring of encirclement Ryko and Velo. They snuck through the nearest bushes, and Stefan, rising in the trench at full height, threw a grenade and shout, No, comrades, come out, I'll cover you. The grenade exploded. The policemen were frightened and ran. Delcho and Zreko took advantage of this. They moved forward, followed by Lina, by Tragko, his wounded wife Danka, and Christio. On the run they threw a grenade. It, too, drove away the policemen and facilitated the escape of their comrades, who had broken out of the encirclement. Once out of danger, they headed toward Kiarane Trava. Todor Medanov's group also attacked from the trench northeast of the post. With him were Baj Pantele, Jai Violeta, Sika, Vancho, Milka, Bonka, and Bosco. They repulsed the attacks of a vastly superior enemy, but just as they were about to break through, Iwa Volitsa, mortally wounded, her comrades rushed to her side. She died a few minutes later, and the survivors followed Zidravko's trail to Delcho. A new attack by the police dismembered MDVZ's group. Pantele, Sika, Milka, and Bojko were in one, and in the other were Todor, Vanko, and Bonka. Milka was already badly wounded, and the two remaining members of their group rushed off in different directions. Left alone, Todor, Vancho, and Bonka headed towards the monastery. Here they were met by a new ambush, but they avoided it and went down the ridge near the village of Kostrashotsi, taking advantage of the enemy's confusion. The rest of the guerrillas withdrew, but what happened to Stefan the comrades did not see. The police, sensing that Stefan was alone, concentrated all their forces against him. He did not respond to the shots. There was only one cartridge left in the magazine of the Manlika. Stefan saved it for himself. I'd rather die by my own bullet than by a vile police bullet, 
he thought as he gazed at the lifeless bodies of Marin and Violeta. Violeta's eyes, her beautiful black eyes that had always looked at him with such warmth, trustfulness and tenderness, were gone. A sharp pain squeezed his chest. He resolved to avenge his slain comrades, rose to his full height, and prepared to put his last bullet in the enemy's face, threatening with his bayonet the policeman who was running toward him. No, stop, you scoundrel, Stefan shouted and pulled the trigger. The Maplicia flashed. There was a rumble, and the policeman fell dead. Now Stefan had only his bayonet left, but he was determined to fight to the end. By the time the last shot rang out, the fog had cleared. The hot sun was shining. Its first rays affectionately illuminated the faces of the three popular fighters, Stefan, Marin and Violeta, thrown by the villains into the bush. Even dead, they looked proud, and from their lips seemed ready to burst the battle cry of the partisans. Death to fascism, freedom to the people. Around noon the bodies of the young heroes were taken by the police to the village of Rayanivsi. They were placed in front of the school. The fascists wanted to intimidate the population. They spread a rumor that the detachment was defeated and its leaders were wounded or killed. But instead of fear, the murderers caused even more anger and indignation among the population, and the love for the people's avengers only increased. After breaking out of the encirclement, Reiko and Vejo crossed the Bohova forest and found themselves at Ogorica a mountain range that cuts off the village of Bohova from the southeast. Here they came across a police platoon coming from Stadkov. The policemen spotted them and opened fire. The two guerrillas jumped into a narrow hollow washed by torrential streams and ran downhill. Bare tree rhizomes clung to their feet. Vejo and Raiko fell, rose, ran again, fell again. This was wearing down their strength more and more and literally at their heels on either side of the hollow were the policemen following them relentlessly. But now the path of the guerrillas was blocked by a huge beach, swept away by the stream and covered with sand. Vailho caught hold of its boughs and fell. An enemy bullet caught him, and Vailho was killed, while little Raiko continued to run and was saved only by a miracle. Rognion and by Zacharias also had to endure many trials. From the post they went down to the monastery forest and hid there until darkness fell. When night fell they decided to try to get to Kaina somehow, but to get to Kalna they had to pass through the Rijanovsky and then through the Slice-off fields, the approaches to which were closely guarded by the police. Not far from Rijanovsky, Ognian and Byzacharius came upon a police patrol. The partisans lay low. Two policemen approached and ours opened fire without warning. One of the policemen fell and the other ran away. Ognian and by Zacharias, taking advantage of this, quickly crossed the field and reached Kalna. Within two days, almost all the partisans who had survived the battle had gathered in Kalna. Besides the dead and wounded Milka, who had been captured by the police, by Pantali, Cedar and Boshko were still missing. Later it turned out that Tisetsa had been captured by the police near the village of Stajkovsi. Boshko returned home and under the pressure of his brother gave himself into the hands of the police, and Bai Pantelli was still missing. The detachment suffered heavy losses. Four were killed, three were captured by the police, and one was missing. Although the enemy had well organized his actions against the partisans, having raised all the available forces of the Okali, although our daring August actions had embittered him terribly, perhaps this terrible disaster could have been avoided if the comrades who led the detachment had taken stricter security measures on that day and had observed the partisan rules to the end. This incident was a lesson to us. Now we knew, partisans must always strictly observe the rules of partisan life and must always be ready to repel any unexpected attack. Having gathered all the surviving fighters, the command seriously thought about how to restore the detachment. This became our first concern. We decided to show the population that the detachment was not defeated, that its leaders were alive and that it continued to strike even bolder blows against the decaying fascist regime. Such a blow was the action against the police company in the village of Glavanovsi, which we had agreed upon with Smajevic and Antunovic. It involved several dozen Yugoslav and Bulgarian partisans and dispelled the fascist lie that the unit had been defeated. From that day Dragulov and Baikushev stopped sleeping at home, which only proved with what incredible speed the fear of the pillars of the regime was growing. The purpose of Comrade Zydrako Georgiev's visit to the Trine district was, 
first to give him an opportunity to familiarise himself with the conditions in which the Trine detachment lived and operated, and second to get acquainted with all of us and to help us as much as possible. As Chief of Staff of the Zone, he was more interested in military matters, but this did not prevent him from considering our party political work. On his instructions, Dencho, who at that time was the Deputy Commissar of the Detachment, took over the duties of the Chief of Staff and took up a combat training of the personnel and intelligence, and Delcho and I continued to fulfil the former functions. Delcho, as Commissar and I, as Commander of the Detachment and in charge of political work in Trinska and Bresniki Okoli. Because of the long interrupted connection with the party leadership of the district, I had to go to Sofia together with Zarko Georgiev to try to re-establish this connection with his help. Back in September, when Zajdravko was in the detachment, he promised to put me in touch with the secretary of the district committee. I did not know his name, did not know where he was from, as was usual in meetings with leading comrades. Later it turned out that Desen was the pseudonym of Georgi Chankov. Under this name we knew him even later when he came to our detachment. The meeting was to take place somewhere in the Banish or neighbourhood, not far from the train station. We arrived with Zerdravko at the appointed time, but Azen was not there. About ten minutes passed. Zizdravko began to worry. He knew his accuracy, and assumed that only a serious reason could have prevented him from being on time. I was no less anxious, for there was a real danger of not meeting the man from the county committee at all. That is why I was afraid even to think that something bad had happened to him, and I was ready to forgive his tardiness, even if it was unjustified, if only he would come. As we were discussing this tardiness, a man appeared on the opposite corner of the street and walked toward us with a confident gait. He wore a raincoat and a cap on his head. From the way Zegrafko was excited, I realised it was Assen. We walked toward him. For a moment we looked at each other's faces, then Assen hugged and kissed me. This is our slacho, he asked. He didn't wait for an answer to his question. He knew everything. He probably wanted to fill the silence somehow. I kissed him too. With great excitement, I walked on his left hand. He asked me a number of questions concerning the state of the unit, its activities, its connection with the people, with the Yugoslav partisans. He was interested in the difficulties we had to meet. From my conversation with him, I realised that the district committee was closely following our work, approved of our actions and demanded that we should link our political work even more closely with the combat activity of the unit, expand our base in the people. The district committee was not able to supply us with arms. We had to take care of this ourselves, attacking police facilities, barracks and solitary fascists. The onset of winter seriously worried the district committee. When Asin asked me what I thought about the possibility of having to prepare dugouts, I replied that we had discussed the matter and had come to the conclusion that dugouts were not necessary, that the police had received information about our first dugout before we had settled in it, that the best solution to the problem of wintering would be to entrench among the people. If we succeeded in this, we would deprive the police of the opportunity to isolate us for the winter from the settlements, to interrupt our connection with our family. At the same time, by strengthening communication with the population, and not only secure the detachment from hunger and cold, but will be able to continuously conduct organisational and mass political work in the whole district, which undoubtedly strengthened our influence among the people, will prepare our future successes in the deployment of the guerrilla struggle. I was glad that the party leadership of the district, represented by the secretary, approved of our work, shared our thoughts, views and plans. This gave us confidence that the detachment act correctly, that we correctly understand and apply in practice the instructions of the party. I, in turn, was interested in some questions, and I put them to the secretary. I asked about the tasks to be solved by the party and youth organisations of the detachment, how to intensify work to expand the base of the Fatherland Front and so on. I received an exhaustive explanation to all the questions. Fascinated by the interesting conversation, I did not notice how we went to Slivnica Boulevard. Suddenly on the street crossing the boulevard we were joined by a young woman of medium height with a vaguely spiritualised face. Asen introduced her to us under the name Katja. It was his wife Jordan. Asen took Zadro under his arm and they walked ahead, Katja and I following them. From the question she asked me I understood that she was the head of the youth organisation. I could sense that she was agonising over the deaths of our comrades and was very upset by the failures 
that had befallen the Remsist organizations in Trinika and Bresnikov districts. Oh, oh, how I long to be there, she said, sighing. It's boring here. It seems to me that I am far from the battle that decides the victory. I want to bear all the sufferings together with our glorious Rem sisters to rejoice with them. I was sure that here, in Sophia, she was struggling and suffering as much as any other Rem sister in the squadron, but that was just the way she was, always striving to take on her shoulders almost all the difficulties associated with the fight. And indeed Katya performed one of the most responsible tasks. She went through prisons, concentration camps, and her life in the underground was constantly fraught with mortal danger. As her secretary of the Central Committee of the RMs, Katya directed and was responsible for the work of thousands of organizations, tens of thousands of Ramsists. The organizational threads of twelve districts converged to her. Dozens of liaisons brought her information and delivered her instructions to the units. These instructions reflected her militant character, the firm will of a revolutionary, the unyielding faith in the near victory over fascism, and yet Katya believed that she was far from the battle. My meeting with Katya was not long. We walked together some two or three hundred meters. In such a short period of time one can express some thoughts, convey some episode, but there was not enough time to characterize the interlocutor, to capture his image. But I remembered her look so firmly, felt the strength of her character, the courage of her, th that she remained in my mind forever. Soon we parted. I still stayed in Sophia, but we did not see Azen and Katya again. I knew that they were very busy with work, but I was sure that not today, tomorrow they would come to the detachment. Zdravko received an assignment from the secretary of the district committee to connect me with comrade Todor Zhivkov. I was not familiar with him either. Later I learned that he was a member of the district committee and was responsible for the Triup and Bresnik district. I met him in a vegetable garden near the mineral springs of Ovchakupel. Here I knew every bush and every boundary. Yanko started the conversation in a joking tone, obviously aiming to make me more talkative. Such people usually know more than those who keep to themselves officially. With people like him a man feels freer, talks not only about the main things but also about unimportant things, and a clever, resourceful leader can draw significant conclusions from all this. Yanko was interested in the most ordinary conversations with women and old people in the village, how we are met by the people, how children play the role of scouts. He asked about the relations of girls and boys in the detachment, about supplies and so on. I gave detailed explanations to all the questions. He made some notes in a notebook, but I did not understand anything in them. Probably it was a kind of coded record which only he alone could understand. Comrade Zivkov approved of the nature of our explanatory work and emphasized that it was necessary to use in the committees of the fatherland, front all honest authoritative people who stood on the side of the people. His criticism that in practice we underestimate the work on the establishment of the fatherland front committees was very thorough. After I had acquainted him with the state of affairs in the Oki, Chenko informed me of the international and internal events that took place in the summer and fall of 1943. 